Better days. I couldn't believe what's happening to me right now. I'm getting escorted by three men dressed in black with bulky bodies. As good as it feels, I also feel scared. If anything happens to me, no one will even know, because I didn't tell anyone that I work at a gay bar as a stripper. I can't believe that I'm doing this for a living. The door opened, revealing a young man sitting on the sofa with a glass of scotch in his hands. He patted the space next to me, and one of his security guards pushed me in front, indicating me to sit next to him. I didn't understand what's going on, but one thing I knew was that my life will be changed when I walk out of this room. In what way? That was yet to be figured out. One month ago. I just finished my five-hour shift on this cafe. I work at coffee as a barista where I experience different people and different stories every day. Hey, can you please do the closing for me? I have to be at my other job. I'm really getting late, said Menon, my friend who works at me at coffee. I always wondered how his life is so better even though we both work at the same place as part-timers. Until last month, he told me about his strip club he works at as a dancer, cum stripper. He offered me to work as well, as it's a new bar and he needs more staff, but I refused. However, I'm still not able to make up the money to get my brother into school or get us proper meals every day. After my parents passed away, I was left with nothing but a younger brother and grandparents who are too old to work. Everything was taken away from me that day, including my education, which led me to work at this cafe for the last two years. Every time I go home, I hope I can give the good news to my brother that he can go to school, unlike me, but affording it is out of the question now. Hey, do they still need more staff at the strip club? I asked, and I saw Menon chuckle. Yeah, but why would you ask? Are you thinking of joining it? He asked back, excitingly. Uh, actually, yes. I think it's the right thing to do for now after seeing you buy a new phone and getting a better house last month. So I guess it's worth it, even though I have other goals right now, I continued, and he told me the address. I finished my work at the cafe and changed from my uniform to my shirt to go check the club. As I reached there, I saw a neon purple sign reading Moonlight Club, which was the name my friend told me. I walked inside and was surprised. It was a completely new world for me. It was dark, covered with dim, colorful lights. There were multiple poles with people on it and tables full of alcohol and cash. Not that there was also customers covered with people's intimate moments. I started searching for my friend, but he was nowhere to be found. After a while, I felt a tap on my shoulder, and I turned to see a man barely covered in any piece of clothing and wearing a mask. I got nervous and backed off until he removed his mask, and I got to know it's Menon. He took me backstage, and we rested in the tiny room he has with all his stuff and costumes. So how is it? Still want to work here? He asked, keeping a thick envelope aside. What's that? I asked. Today's payment, he said, as he opened it and started counting. It was 5,000, which shocked both of us. He said he usually gets that much and is able to live a better life. When can I start? I asked, and he laughed. Tomorrow, maybe. I will talk to the boss today. Come with me, he said, and we went to the owner's office. He asked for my family background and if I have any skills like singing and dancing. I told him I was a dancer and I participated in multiple things until last year. Everything changed after my parents' death and all I could focus on was how to make mine and my family's life better. The owner hired me because of Menon's kind words and I will be starting tomorrow. Another day started, just normal. I got up to my grandmother's voice calling me to have breakfast before I went to work. It's a sweet ritual that we all follow after my parents passed away, that is to eat at least one meal together. I sat down at the table and looked at Brad, my brother. I promise you that we will be going to school soon, I told him, and he happily smiled and hugged me. I told my grandparents that I got another job as a dance teacher in a wealthy family uphill, so I will be late. I hate to lie, but I had to lie. I got my stuff and I left for the cafe. I started working there, but I was nervous the entire time, thinking about the dancing. I'm thankful that we can wear masks, or else I doubt I would be able to agree upon something like this. Soon, five hours ended, and I closed my shift. I started walking towards the club as slowly as I still had an hour left. My shift at the club started around 8. I reached on time, and I was taken to a small room, smaller than Menon's, which barely had a space for three or four people to stand. So it was good enough, I guess. The manager came into my room to meet me and introduced me to everyone else. They taught me how to dress and what exactly to do. It was time for my performance to start. I was getting nervous. I could hear my heart beating fast and my body shivering. Then I remembered every other time I danced and how much joy it brought me. I decided to leave the fear behind and remember Brad's smiling face and how happy he will be to go to school like the other children in our area. As I walked on stage wearing a harness costume which only covered my bottom, I was given a big black mask that covered more than half of my face. As I moved towards the pole, I heard a bunch of men shouting. It gave me confidence to perform better. I jumped on the pole and the music started. Five minutes later, the song ended and I had already engaged more customers than there were before. I noticed a bunch of them throwing money at me. Menon told me that I am supposed to take all the money as extra tip until I become popular enough to have someone pick those notes up for me. I did as I was told. I thanked everyone who complimented me. 
I started picking up some notes one by one, and the embarrassment was taking over me until I reached the VIP table, where a bulky man in all black standing straight to a man whose face was not visible. The guard handed me a piece of paper which, when I turned, I noticed that it was a check for $10,000. I almost dropped it, seeing the amount. I thanked the man standing there, and then he asked me to move out of there. I went back to my room to change my clothes and left for home. Before reaching home, I cashed the check and texted my boss in the cafe to ask for a day off. He agreed, as I don't really take leave from work. I didn't know that the day would come this soon. As I reached home, I took a shower and went to sleep. The next morning, I went to Brad's room and woke him up, asking him to get ready for a surprise. He came down and I took him to the school I used to study in when I was a kid. Am I going to study here, Isaac? He asked. Yes, buddy, you will. Now, when we all go inside, don't get nervous. Just be yourself, I told him, and we went inside. The interview went well, as the principal knew me and my situations. He didn't bother asking Brad many questions and took him in for second grade, considering he was homeschooled by me for two years. I paid the fees and got the list of supplies. Let's go shopping for your new school, I asked, and saw him happy. Yes, he exclaimed. I took him to all the places I used to hang out before and shop for him. We looked for uniforms and some books. I said, can I have five dollars? Why, I asked. Please. Okay, I said, handing the kid five dollars. He left me there as I was paying the bill for his books and returned back with two cones of ice cream. I smiled and kissed his forehead. Thank you, Isaac. You are the best brother, he said, which made me feel that everything I am doing is worth it. I went back home and I got ready to go to the club. With the same routine, I started getting ready and then moved on stage. After finishing, I walked to collect money and found the same man sitting in the same place, again with his face hidden behind his men. One of them asked me to come towards them and handed me another check with the same amount written. All of a sudden, it all felt weird and I walked back to my room. This continued for two more days until one day in my performance, I noticed the VAP seat empty, wondering what might have happened. After taking money from everyone else, I was walking toward my room, but I noticed a bunch of people standing in front of the room. Mr. Isaac, come with us, he asked me in a serious tone. Come where? Who are you all? I asked back, but got no answer. One of them walked towards me and pushed their hand on my shoulder, making me turn and walk forward. I got very scared and started asking more questions, but got no reply. I tried screaming, but no one could hear me because of the loud music. After a minute, I was standing in front of a luxurious room, doors covered in golden paint, and securities on the side. The door opened, revealing a young man sitting on the sofa with a glass of scotch in his hands. I looked around as I entered the room. It was a room with a high roof, windows covered with full-length red curtains. It was dark, so I was unable to figure out who this person was from far away. He patted the space next to me, and one of his security guards pushed me in front, indicating to me to sit next to him. As I sat, I realized it was none other than Charlie Turner, a celebrity. Brad always shows me his videos where he plays the role of a young policeman, which motivated Brad to think of becoming one. Are you really Charlie Turner? I was shocked. He simply nodded his head, taking another sip of his drink. Drinks? He asked me, and I said no. I usually don't drink, and specifically not with people I just met. Let them be whoever. But why have you called me here? I figured I could be of help to you. And you can be the same for me, he said. Can you be clear? I didn't understand, I asked, thinking of what help can a person like me be to a celebrity. I know you need money. Everyone who comes here is either in need of money or have excess of it. It is true, what he said. I noticed it in a month of working here. Stay with me. Pretend to be my boyfriend and I will pay you 30000 a month, he said, leaving me in shock. What? No, I said sternly. See, I have my reasons. Plus, you will be in profit, he said, trying to convince me. There can be no reason or profit in buying a human to stay with you and fake a relationship. I stood up, thinking of leaving from there. I was getting offended, and I felt rage in me. Is wanting someone to stay by my side because I have cancer not a good reason? He said. That made me stop my steps immediately. Wait, is that true? I asked as I turned back. Everyone leave, he ordered, and everyone present in the room left. Sit down, he asked me to sit, and I sat on the sofa in front of him. I found out a few months back that I have cancer. Except for my close family, no one knows about it. Now you do too. But why do you want someone to stay with you, I asked. Not just someone. I want you to stay with me. I've seen you many times at this bar. You have grace like no other man has, he said, making me shy. But why? Listen, I know it might be a lot for you, but you know you need it too. You can help me live the best of my life in front of cameras by pretending to be my boyfriend, so people stop seeing me as something I am not, a player who fools around with chicks or a man running behind fame. I want my real fans to know the real me, who is gay and not someone who sleeps with girls to get famous, he said. Every word he said made me see his sincerity more and more, and he was right. 
I do need the money. Until when can I work two jobs and not follow my dream of pursuing my education and starting my own companies and NGOs? You can still say no if you'd want to. No one will force you to. I cut him off and said, I accept the offer. What? Really? He said, looking straight at me with shine in his eyes. Yes, I agree, I repeated myself. Okay, that's great. Now, I just need you to sign this contract for me, he said, giving me some papers. What is this? I asked. It's a contract that says you will be my pretentious boyfriend for six months. You will get 30000 every month and I will take care of your public image as well. Whereas you have to make sure you take care of my public image and you should not be seen with any other men while being in this contract or else you will have to pay a penalty of $1 million, he finished. And I scoffed while listening to the last line of the contract. $1 million? How am I supposed to pay that? I've never even seen that much money. Well then, just follow the contract, and if you do good, you never know. You might own one million dollars, he replied with a smirk. I nodded my head and signed the paper. Pack all your stuff from here. You won't be working here anymore, he ordered. What? Why? I questioned him back. You think it'll be nice if Charlie's boyfriend is a dancer in a strip club and people get to know about it? You will be in the eyes of the camera sometimes, so save your image and mine, he said. And one last thing. No personal feelings involved. This is just a contract, he said, and I nodded. I did as asked. I cleared my room and gave some excuse to Menon. My boss already approved my resignation. Apparently, Charlie handed this for me. For a moment, I was actually happy because I was getting tired and embarrassed of working in a strip club and having random men touch me and throw money at me. Next morning, I woke up with the sound of a constant horn. I realized it must be Charlie, as the area I live in would never have a car this big and expensive. Even though my grandparents didn't care much, I still informed them so that they don't have to hear anything from outside. However, nowadays I started covering the full truth. I got ready and told my grandmother that it's the people who I teach dance to. She just nodded and asked me to work well. Hey, that's a cool car, Isaac. Can I get a ride? He asked, and I didn't know what to say. He then jumped out immediately and got in the car. I ran behind him to stop him, but it was too late. He was standing in front of the car with his mouth open wide. Charlie Turner? He mouthed. I put him inside the car and sat. I'm sorry, he is my younger brother, Brad. Hello, Brad. Nice to meet you, Charlie said, forwarding his hand. Do you teach dance to Charlie Turner? Brad asked, looking at me. I heard Charlie laugh at the back. Uh, Brad, the thing is, yes, your brother teaches me dance, and he is an amazing dancer, he said, cutting me off. Yes, he is amazing. Can you drop me to school, Charlie? Brad asked, and I was embarrassed. Brad, no, your school bus will come soon, I said, trying to get him out of there before he asks any more questions. Of course, but only if you keep our meeting a secret. I want to surprise people with my performance, which your brother is teaching me. You can't ruin it, okay? He said sweetly, and Brad agreed. We drove Brad to his school, and he got off. Where are we off to? I asked Charlie. First, we need to do something about your hair and clothes. No offense. They look decent, but you need a makeover, he said. I just rolled my eyes, because deep down, I know it's true. We reached the salon where this guard safely got us inside from the back door. He told me he's been coming here for years, and none of the paparazzi caught him here. We entered the place and looked posh, yet normal at the same time. He introduced me to Taylor, his barber. Hey, Taylor. Meet my boyfriend, Isaac, he said. And I thought, how fast this thing started, that now he's introducing me as his boyfriend. Get habitual to this, Isaac, Charlie said, and sat back. Leave it on, Taylor. He knows what to do. An hour went by with all the grooming I was getting. In between, I also got some people around showing me various clothes like shirts and trousers and shoes, many more things. I felt like a celebrity. This was something I never thought I would get to experience. We went to the restaurant after we were done to do the big reveal. We chose a spot where it will be easy for paparazzi to find us because Charlie wanted to start it and get done with it soon. As we got out of the place, I was surrounded by a bunch of different men and women, all with flashes all in shouting Charlie's name loudly. I was getting stuck by his fans, so he came back, held my hand, and walked forward with me. This already created some buzz between them as I could hear them hooting for us. We quickly walked and sat in the car. Good job. This is all you have to do. Be with me and pretend to be my boyfriend how you did just now, Charlie said. He drew me back home and I was already feeling tired. I met Brad on my way to the room and asked him in case he told his to anyone. He said he did not, as he promised Charlie. I pat his head and went back to my room to have a good sleep. One thing that was in my mind the entire time was how he came and held my hand to get me out of there. One thing he still doesn't know is that I hate flashlights. It's because of the car accident my parents got into, which took their life. It scares me, and he saved me from it unknowingly. This continued for almost a month. In the middle, sometimes, Brad would accompany us, and I already saw how close Charlie and him got. I never saw a side of a celebrity, let alone be Charlie or Brad, who doesn't talk to any stranger. 
I was getting used to the life and treatment I was getting now. Always surrounded by people, having good clothes to wear, and even eating at expensive places I never thought I could. Charlie sent a dinner off today, and it was just him and I driving at night. Recently we started having some peaceful time, which I feel is important for Charlie, so we can take a break and rest from all this fame and papas and worries. We stopped at McDonald's, and he ordered a coffee for both of us. Soon, my phone received a notification. I checked it, and it said $30,000, which brought me back to reality, that after all this is all a contract. I realized how I was losing the hold of myself and started thinking of Charlie as a friend. It was not just him who needed someone to stay with him, but me too. I too needed someone to stay with me and be there for me. But at the end of the month, a phone notification with a bunch of digits changed my thoughts. Tomorrow, there is a celebration dinner. My family will be there, so you will meet them, personally, he said, informing me about my tomorrow's schedule. I wore the suit he sent and got dressed for the occasion. I was initially nervous to meet his family, but when I saw it as part of the deal, the nervousness took off and the sadness took over. I was confused, too, for feeling this way. I walked out of my house and a car was already waiting for me. I sat inside and in a good 30 minutes, we reached. I opened the door to a port where many ships were standing. There was a white color ship, looking more lively than the others, with a bunch of people in lighting. I guess that's the one I had to go to, and I was right. As I started getting in, I was covered by many cameras, which made me uncomfortable. Out of nowhere, security came and escorted me safely inside. I noticed a guard making contact with Charlie, and then they both nodded at each other, proving that Charlie sent them to escort me. Hi, you look good, he said, and I complimented him back. Okay, let's meet my family now, shall we? He asked placing his hand on my waist and moving me forward along with him. Mom, this is Isaac, my boyfriend. Oh, uh, hi Isaac, nice to meet you, she said, but her tone felt off. One by one I met his sister, his father, and his best friends, but I felt off with everyone. For some reason I was worried that they didn't like me. Not that it should matter, but still mattered for me. I excused myself from there, but I overheard one of his friends talking to his parents saying, Looks like Charlie picked me up from the garbage. It made me feel so bad and I felt like I had lost self-respect. I moved from there without saying anything, for the sake of Charlie. I want him to enjoy stuff like this before it's late. I picked up a drink and started having it. I was standing in the middle of the ocean on a yacht. I felt like every dream came true, yet I got nothing. That's when I realized I broke the biggest rule of the contract by falling in love with Charlie. Hey, what are you doing here, standing alone? I heard the voice and turned behind to see Charlie standing there. Oh, you are here. Well, I'm liking it. Finally, some peace, I said, and he stood next to me. Yeah, peace. That's what I feel with you, he said, then felt shy. What is the point? This is just a contract. I am at peace you bought, I said, laughing. What happened? Why are you talking like that all of a sudden, he asked me, and I continued laughing. Do you also think I'm garbage? Your family and friends think this way, I blurted out without realizing. You're drunk, Isaac. Come with me, he said, holding me by my waist and arm, mapping away from me downstairs to his room. I don't think you're garbage. If anyone is, it's them who thinks that way. All they care about is money and popularity. They don't even care about their dying son, Charlie said, making me stop and turn towards him. Don't say that again. You're not dying, I said, and I pressed my lips against his without caring about anything anymore. To my surprise, he did not move back or push me away, but I stopped. I'm sorry. I must be drunk. No, don't be sorry. I am in fact thankful, he said. What? But the contract... Fuck the contract, he said, smashing his lips on mine. Hard this time. We moved to his room and did not come out until it was morning, and I found myself sleeping on his arms, partially naked. I was shy and did not know what I did was wrong or right. I started getting up until I was pulled by him. Where do you think you're going? He asked, smiling. Uh, I'm just going out before anyone sees us this way, I said, making excuses. I think our strat was to show people, but now I don't care about any, and you shouldn't either, Isaac, he said and I felt nice. I felt homely after a very long time. I laid back down, staring at him, planting a few kisses on his face and shoulders. So what about the contract? Do I have to pay a penalty? I said, and he started laughing. No, you don't, because I'm pretty sure I fell in love with you before you did, he said, and smiled at me. We got up and got dressed to go out. Yacht was about to reach the shore. As we got out, a lot of people were already standing there, ready to get off. Charlie bid bye to everyone and thanked him, except he ignored his family and walked away from them. I will drop you home, he said, and walked to his car. I reached home and got a fresh. I was happy with myself after a very long time. I felt good and I thought I deserved some happiness too. Not so later, six months came to an end and our contract legally ended because it ended 
long back for us. In these six months, we have come very far. Charlie and I decided to open the NGOs for children suffering from cancer and orphan kids. We signed the project together, which was a year long. Charlie took Brad on vacation with us, and it was the best time we all had. My life was falling into place until today. Charlie suggested we go somewhere peaceful, where not many people know him, and I knew the exact place. I took him to Weedham Park, a park near my area, which is small, quiet, and peaceful, and I'm pretty sure no one will know him there. I'm so grateful that I got to meet you in this lifetime. Thank you, but I'm more grateful. What have you done for me and my family? For Brad? I can never repay you for that, I replied. You don't have to repay me for anything. Just live your life and fulfill your dream. Fulfill our dream together of getting to the children in need together, he said, making me smile and also giving me a teary smile. We sat on the bench and saw trees slowly moving. The breeze was cool and soothing. I held Charles's hand and he laid his head on my face. It felt like a perfect time to say this. I love you, Charlie, I said, smiling, hoping to hear it back, but it never came. Charlie? 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 I shouted his name and I heard no reply, no movement, no response. My heart stopped. I realized what had happened, but what broke my heart more was that he knew was going to happen, and that's why he chose a quiet place to be in today. How could he not tell me? I stayed there still. The breeze was hitting both of our skin, but only I was able to feel the coldness in it. I cried there continuously for I don't know how long, but it was time, and I couldn't delay it. I slowly held his hand and kissed it. I picked him up and walked towards his car to lay him inside and reach his home. Conclusion It's been a month since Charlie passed away. Isaac and Charlie's family attended his funeral, whereas various fans waited outside his house to bid their goodbyes to him. Isaac's life has been changed completely. Isaac received a letter from a college confirming his enrollment in the college, which he never applied to but always wanted to pursue. He smiled knowing Charlie did it for him. His focus now was to finish his education and build a dream they started together. In a year, Isaac was able to get the degree with exceptional performance, but rejected most of the companies to work in. He knew where he had to work and where his focus should be. He used all the funds Charlie left for his use to grow on the NGOs. Isaac decided to name it Sky, which was a role played by Charlie, which both Isaac and Charlie loved. The inauguration day happened, and Isaac looked up to thank Charlie for the life he gave him, and also Brad. Isaac never got to hear those words back from Charlie, but Charlie said it all even without saying anything. The End Did you expect this ending? If not, then what did you think of it? The Great Cuddle Buddy Storms were the bane of my existence. I have never been fond of the boisterous thunders and never found the same comfort in rain as did everyone else. There was no problem when I was still a young boy who sought my mother or my sister's comfort whenever a storm was raging. But now, as an adult who had just moved out and is living in his first apartment, it was a problem. That was until I met my current roommate, Theo. As I watched Theo now over dinner, we were having asparagus and salmon, courtesy of my impeccable cooking. I wondered how I had seized such a magnetic force of a man for a roommate. Not only was he good looking with his intensely hazel round eyes and sharp nose, he was also extremely intelligent. At first he was intimidating, but over time, I grew on him. Beyond his strapping body and daunting presence, he was actually a kind man, when you think about it. Lucky for me, that man was the great cuddle buddy of mine. Odd, I know, but it started one fateful night in the midst of a terrible storm. We had only been living together for about a month. Although we were cordial, we were not that close yet before that night. The winds of that night were harsh and the pitch black clouds were already foreshadowing a terrible storm. So in the middle of that night, when power went off because of the sheer intensity of the storm, I was not half surprised. Fully awake and having my ninth anxiety attack of the night, I got up and used my phone as a flashlight. I was en route to the stockroom where I kept our supplies for power outages, like this, when I bumped into Theo. Couldn't sleep? He asked. I shook my head and reached for the emergency light. No, much too noisy and a tad bit terrifying if you ask me. You? I asked as I set the lamp on the center table and plopped down on our couch. He picked up his emergency light and set it next to mine before sitting beside me. Me neither. I was working, but I guess I can't now. I laughed. Wow, I can only wish I had half the courage to just ignore the storm. He looked perplexed and raised an eyebrow at me. You scared of... Oh my god, Colin, you're shivering. He observed as I started trembling uncontrollably when another round of thunder echoed throughout the house. It's the thunder. That's why I couldn't sleep, I confessed. 
slightly sheepish that I was essentially exposing this fear of mine to my roommate. He scooted closer and put his hand on mine. My eyes lingered a bit too long on his hand, bewildered at my body's sudden electric reaction about our skin's meeting. I recovered enough and averted my gaze back to his face. His touch was soothing and his eyes were magnetic. It awakened something in me that I have never quite felt. Was it attraction towards the same sex? Or was it merely the comfort that he provided me with at this moment? He was now stroking my hand, and while this calmed my anxiety about the raging storm, it sent my heart plummeting. Would it help if I tell stories? I nodded, although I did not know for sure if that would calm me down. When I was a kid, my mother would simply cuddle with me and stroke my hand until I fell asleep, during such a petrifying storm. It had been a while since I received comfort during times like this, so I was alien as to how I would react. But as he told stories about his workplace, he was a writer in a nearby publishing house, I was entertained and distracted from the storm. But I was not focusing that much on his tales, but rather his magnetic eyes. They were beautiful. His soothing voice, coupled with the hand stroking my arm oh so gently, I managed to calm down. He grinned once I affirmed that I was good. You want me to accompany you until you fall asleep? He offered as we were walking towards my room, each holding our respective emergency lights. Oh, that would be too much trouble for you, Theo, I replied politely. Fuck yes, I want you to accompany me. I'm just not that shameless to admit it out loud. I was also conscious and did not want him to feel that I was a tad bit too excited for his little arrangement. I plopped down on my bed and tucked myself in, still rather conscious with him at my door standing and observing my every move. Can I come in? He asked politely. To this day, I do not know where I mustered my courage, but I nodded vigorously and tapped the spot next to me on my bed. He sat carefully on the bed, flashing me a weak smile and looking rather flushed. Just as when we thought the storm was calming down and I could finally get some tranquility, another round of lightning and thunder raged on and I started getting anxious once more. To my disbelief, Theo scooted over and attempted to spoon me. May I try? He asked. Surely, I was very bewildered, but nonetheless willing. After all, it was just a cuddle, right? It was merely a show of comfort between two friends. Almost instantly, I felt my breath under control again, and he pulled me even closer. Every now and then, he would stroke my arm as he did in the living room, and I sighed inaudibly. This felt good. It felt right. I could not help but smile. Who would have thought that as an adult, I would remain to find comfort in cuddles and nestling? But not through my mother this time around. Through this man. Through my roommate, Theo. Although it took me a while to fall asleep that night, purely because I was so giddy and at peace with this beautiful man cuddling with me, I eventually did. And I did fall asleep with him, snuggled to me plenty of times after that. It became a routine whenever it was stormy until we even started incorporating it when we watched television together, like now. It was Friday, so that meant the movie night for me and Theo. This week, he was going to pick the movie, and I was in charge of cooking. I made some cheesy pickle nachos for us and ordered beer for him and soda for me. How does Annabelle Comes Home sound, Colin? He asked as I was bringing over the food. I rolled my eyes but nodded nevertheless. Aligned with his very macho outlook, he was a massive fan of horror movies, while I was basically a coward and got scared shitless by the smallest of jump scares. We were juxtapositions, but it worked. We completed each other like a puzzle piece. As usual, we were on the opposite sides of the couch facing the massive television and snacking on the food. But sooner or later, I found myself slowly scooting over towards him, half scared and half using his opportunity to be in his proximity. Sly, I know, but we gotta do what we gotta do, right? Sooner or later, he pulled me in closer, himself, and I snugged against his hard body, relishing his scent. This was such a pleasant distraction from movies. I can stomach watching horror movies now if we can remain like this all the time, I bantered. I was not really joking, honestly. I enjoyed this far too much. I enjoyed when he wrapped his arms so securely around me, with his smooth and kissable cheek resting atop my disheveled brown hair. He was holding me so close that I could almost hear his breathing. This accelerated my own breathing. It was as if we were one entity intertwined and breathing as one. Our weekly cuddles on Friday movie nights became so frequent that they soon became habitual. To my elation, they became nightly. It usually started off like this. He would unwind with either a cup of green tea or a glass of wine after a long day of work. He had his spot on the couch that he liked. Meanwhile, 
I would watch whatever I was interested on Netflix or HBO go that night. Currently, I was watching Euphoria, and with the amount of sex drive exuding in that show, you cannot blame me for wanting a bit of action myself, even if that action merely came in Theo's cuddles. I would always scoot closer and he would take that as a cue to pull me into his strong arms and snuggle against me while he read and I continued watching. However, lately, he had been initiating these cuddles too. I would be chilling on our couch after dinner, nose buried on my phone and aimlessly scrolling social media, while he would be, as usual, unwinding with a book. He would reach for my arm, stroking it. I tried not to read too much of this, lest I find myself hoping that he felt the same attraction towards me as I did him. It was merely habitual, I believe. And then he would inch closer until he would eventually rest his hand on my shoulder, or vice versa. His gorgeous face would always be so close that I could almost count how many eyelashes framed his intense eyes. Cuddle buddies, huh? I said one night, raising my eyebrows. I was re-watching Encanto one night while he was, as usual, reading some Dickens, while our legs were hooked over each other and he was curled tightly against my chest. Uh-huh, he replied absent-mindedly. You do this with all your other buddies, or what? He gazed at me perplexedly. Bold of you to assume I have other buddies, he retorted. You're the only warm body I want to be snuggled up against, okay? I laughed, feeling giddy, but trying to play it off. Don't be too overzealous about this, Colin. You might sense your over-enthusiasm and quit this arrangement. Whatever it may be. Deep down, I knew my feelings were escalating. I mean, how could they not? From the moment I laid my eyes on this man, he was out of this world. He was beautiful, both inside and out. Once you get to know him, beneath his rough and intimidating exterior, he was kind and very intelligent. He was opinionated and well-read, traits I so valued in a man. Intelligence is sexy. Wow, the only warm body. Please do inform me if you're into necrophilia instead. I might have to find another roommate then. He chuckled. Never, and besides, you'd never dream of replacing me. At least he got that one right. Weeks later, I heard there was another storm coming, and this was expected to last at least three days, so I made sure to stock up. The rain was already pouring by the time I got back home from the store, and Theo was nowhere to be found, so I unloaded the groceries myself. I was just reaching to put cans of tomato soup into our overhead shelf when the front door was unlocked. Honey, I'm home, Theo said playfully. I rolled my eyes, although my heart was somersaulting and my stomach was filled with butterflies. This man knew how to push my buttons in all the right places. Usually, I would be a bit more conscious for the fear that my blossoming intentions would be revealed. But just that day, I felt a tad bit more flirty than usual. Well, darling, like the good stay-at-home husband I am, I've diligently done our groceries for a week, in case the storm does not subdue by then. Theo came over to the side of the kitchen that I was standing at and ruffled my already messy hair. He leaned closer, so close that I could in fact smell his minty fresh breath and the heat of his breathing on the side of my face. I was almost certain I was flushing because of his mere proximity. Thank you, my honey, he winked. But despite doing the groceries, it seems like you can't reach for the shelves to put them in their place. I hit his arm playfully and he let out an adorable chuckle. He took the tomato can from me and placed it effortlessly on the top shelf. Yes, that is the perk of being tall. Not that I envied him or anything, but my delusion was whispering that if we were to kiss, then him leaning down to kiss me because of my shorter height would just be stomach turning. There I go again with my whims and deep-rooted desires. I prepared my sumptuous dinner for us, likely the last proper one we would have before our power gets cut off again. Although Theo kindly borrowed a generator for us, it would only be used for essential activities, such as charging our devices and our lamps. For that night, I made some mashed potatoes and steak, Theo's favorite. I relished the sounds of contentment he made across the table, evidently enjoying my cooking. Cooking was one of my love languages, and although I could not confess my feelings for him yet, I expressed it through the food that I so passionately cooked for him. It was always made with love. Look, this is too good, Cole, he complimented. I really might just have to wife you up after this. I was pretty sure I flushed all the way through that night after he said that. The storm was already picking up. Our surroundings pitch black and the gusts of wind strong. We were both in the living room, deciding it was better for us to hang out there and sleep there as our town braved the storm. I was elated because I knew that the darkness coupled by the roaring thunder would be enough of an excuse for us to cuddle. Not that we had not been making it a routine nightly, with either of us going to each other's room and just cuddling until we both fell asleep. 
At least we were saving electricity, right? We were essentially sleeping in one room and only using one fan nightly after all. Dio was just reading while I was snuggled up against him with the power turned off, shortly after 11. I suppose the winds were getting too strong and the power lines were knocked down. Oh well, my cue to sleep. He announced as he put down the book he was reading on the center table. Let's go to bed then, I replied a bit too nonchalantly. Why was I getting used to this? Could I really be content that we were merely roommates and cuddle buddies? Or was I ready for more? That night I held him a little closer and snugged up against him a bit more than usual, lest it would be our last night of being this way, as I was concocting a plan to finally confess to him. I did not know when or how or what to say even. All I knew was that it was going to come out when it needed to, but for now, I pressed my forehead against his collarbone and rested my hand across his waist. In his sleep, he subconsciously hitched a leg around my thigh, pulling me even closer, if that was possible. I looked up at him and my heart stopped at the sight. He looked so peaceful in his sleep, no frown lines or wrinkles visible. He was breathing steadily and it was comforting amidst the rumbling sounds of thunder every now and then. He was my peace. I thought of our friendship and how the confession I was planning might change it, but now that this idea has plagued my mind, it would be hard to abandon it. As he snored lightly that night, I chuckled and touched my nose to the tip of his, just adoring his mannerisms, and thankful that I got to share moments like this with him. We both did our own work and mind our own business the entirety of the next day. Honest to God, I needed the space from him so I spent the majority of my time in my bedroom despite the occasional thunder and pouring rain giving me so much apprehension. I thought that if I had to be in that close of a proximity as him for so long, the passion I was feeling might just burst into flames and I might confess impulsively. It was not until dinner that I had come face to face with him. He did not think anything amiss and he was just enjoying the broccoli and chicken leg that I had made for dinner. But as for me, I was observing him. There was no denying it, I was in love with this man. As he sat there devouring the spread and talking about books, I realized that I had indeed fallen into the abyss of love. Not much of a reader yourself, are you? He asked, trying to stir up conversation in the dinner table. I suppose I was being much too quiet. I shook my head. If you count gossip sites and Twitter, then indeed I am, but as for the books that you read, nope, I replied. He clucked his tongue and reached for my hand on the table. We must change that. There are so many different worlds you can travel to, people you can meet, adventures you can partake in, and love stories to be unraveled by picking up a book, Cole. Well, give me your recommendations then. You said you like glitz and glam of Hollywood, right? You have to read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, he suggested before going on and on about the plot and amazing things about the book. Try as I might to cling unto his every word, I was much too distracted by his eyes and his lips and the thought of what I might do to those lips consumed me. And so, I did what was the most common thing to do. I blurted out my emotions that very moment. I'm in love with you. I, I beg your pardon? He stuttered. I swallowed a lump on my throat and looked him dead in the eyes. It was now or never. If I do not have the courage to tell him how I truly felt, I never would. Hearing you talk about books and how passionate you are, it does things to me. You're highly intimidating and too gorgeous for words. But deep down, you're an impeccable man, with kindness that I cannot even dream of possessing myself. You are everything that I want and more. It started off with cuddles and I thought that you were merely providing me with comfort, but it grew to be so much more than that. I'm in love with you. You can't be serious, he uttered. My heart broke into a million pieces at once. This is what I feared. He did not reciprocate and now our bond is over. I have ruined it. I'm sorry, this was a mistake, I started. I'm in love with you too. I've been searching high and low for what I may do to express that, but I'm just not one for romantic gestures. So I expressed it in the littlest of things while I tried to convince myself to finally muster up the courage and confess, but you did it first. I began tearing up, and sooner or later, we stood up and gave each other a bear hug. He held me more tightly this time around, and I could not help but feel a different kind of content. Whenever we had cuddled in the past, I felt content because I was in his arms. But I knew that was fleeting, but this was not the same. There was hope for us. There awaits a future for us because he loves me, as I do him. This is the chapter where the great cuddle buddy turns into my boyfriend, I joked. That happens to be the content of the book, would you finally get to reading? He bantered right back, touching the tip of his nose on mine. The height difference was fairly obvious now. 
and I was not going to lie. It was cute. Maybe, I teased. Well then, the great cuddle buddies are officially boyfriends, he replied. Would you look at that, from cuddling during storms to snuggling every night to this. We have plenty of more storms to weather together, darling. To be continued. The Great Cuddle Buddy, Part 2 Beginnings were always special. I personally had not been in plenty of relationships and was relatively inexperienced compared to my resident cuddle buddy roommate and boyfriend Theo. It had been months since we were stuck at home during a storm and I finally confessed how I felt to him in a heat of the moment exchange. In an unexpected twist of fate, he felt the same. We had been inseparable since then. Cold and thrilling Netflix movies now turned into snuggly smooch fests, take our cuddling when we were still only friends and roommates, and add passionate kissing to that. That was us right now. Theo had just bought these thin framed round glasses, almost Harry Potter-esque if you ask me, and had his nose buried as usual on some work by Lord Byron. I found the sight extremely hot, my man in a muscle tee showing off his biceps, wearing his new reading glasses and reading some poetry. Hot, was it not? That was my buff geek right there and he was mine. I then scooted closer. Suddenly, the new season of Brighton that I was initially watching was not as interesting anymore and I instead was bent on distracting my boyfriend. I inched closer towards him until I was almost on his lap. Whoa there, what's gotten into you, he said inquisitively, as I desperately kissed his neck. I stopped my attack on his skin and looked at him, dead in his hazel eyes. You don't like it? Baby, I love it, he replied. Just surprised, that's all. Surprised? It's all we ever do these days, babe. It's not like we spend our time together Bible studying or something, I bantered. Smooch all day? Sure, but neck kissing? That's new, he whispered, with his face only inches from mine. I could feel the heat of his breath on my face. I could also feel my own breathing turning quite hefty. Boldly, I perched myself on his lap, all the while looking into his eyes. I was pretty sure I was giving him fuck-me eyes because he stared right back with just as much intensity. Baby, he breathed as I continued the attack on his neck. I tossed his clothes aside, revealing his firm chest and toned abdomen. He was a fine piece of man. I was one lucky bastard. Fuck, you're so hot, I replied. He leaned in for yet another kiss, attacking me with his tongue and toying my lips with his teeth. He was sucking at my lips as if his life depended on his, and I was kissing him back with just as much hunger and desperation. Prior to Theo, I had yet to experience anything of this intensity. Surely, I dated girls back in the day, but nothing could come close to how I was feeling with him. I could savor the feeling of our lips touching for a lifetime. That's how good it was. I'm gonna lose control if we don't stop, darling, he whispered airily, while I sat on his lap. I did not reply, and instead, shut him up with yet another kiss and another, and another. He brushed his lips against me, this time delicately and lingering. I felt his minty breath against mine and I closed my eyes, just relishing the time I had with my man. Baby, again, if you don't stop right now, I cannot guarantee that I will have the control to do so later, warned Theo yet again. I looked at him dead in the eyes and momentarily thanked the heavens that his man was mine. With much conviction, I told him, I don't want you to stop. Since that fateful day, we had been at it like rabbits. We were like animals out in the Sahara, ravishing each other fiercely and with so much passion day and night. Seeing that we both realized we were gay because of how we felt towards one another, it was our first time to have that kind of sex, and boy did it blow my mind. Before then, I never even knew that it could be that good. Theo was taking me to places I never could have dreamt of. We were both figuring this out together, and the possibilities are endless. We had so much to explore, and we were along for the ride. So much for the beginning of my sexual escapades with the love of my life. We were having a peaceful Sunday. I was finally teaching Theo some basics in the kitchen while we blasted Planet, her, and our speakers when my best friend Nicolette burst through the front door unannounced. Hi, Theo, she greeted. I had introduced them weeks ago and they hit it right off. Seeing that Theo worked in publishing house and Nicolette was an English professor in a nearby college, they both shared an instant bond over books. I rolled my eyes jokingly and greeted my old friend. I'm here, Nix, I bantered. Oh, hi, stranger. Long time no see. The way I introduced you two, and now she's more of your friend than she is mine, I joked to Theo. He laughed, but deep down, I was touched that he was bonding so well with such an important person in my life. After months of dating, our friends were intertwining, and we were getting to know each other's loved ones. It was an important milestone. Look, Theo and stranger, continued Nicolette. I need a babysitter tonight. Please, I beg you to. Please, please going on a date, aren't you? 
I raised my eyebrow. Nyx rolled her eyes and playfully hit my arm. You won't deprive your childhood best friend the chance to find true love now that you've found yours, will you? She begged. So that was how Theo and I ended up babysitting my nephew, Nick's one-year-old son, Kyle, that night. I was whipping up a simple dinner for us. Some herby chicken, breasts, and salad. Once Theo sat with Kyle in the living room, Look, Kyle, it's Special Agent Oso, said Theo enthusiastically. I could not help but smile at the sight of him playing with the young boy. He looked so natural and in his element. Who could have known? Mr. Oso oh Intimidating Muscle Man actually had soft spot for kids. The mere sight tugged on my heartstrings. How was my man so versatile? He could be lifting weights one moment, and then reading the next moment. He could be writing some romantic poetry one moment, and then babysitting so effortlessly the next moment. You're a natural, babe, I teased as I settled our respective plates and sat on the couch next to them. He pompously huffed his cheeks and winked. Future baby daddy, am I not? He teased right back. I flushed almost instantly. The thought of one day building a family with him was a picture that crossed my mind often these days. I suppose there comes a point when your relationship is stable, and despite being together for quite some time, you cannot see yourself getting tired of the other person anytime soon. That was me with Theo. Don't play with fire, my love. You might find me agreeing to with that idea. I poked, not backing out at its advances. Go ahead and eat first, love. I know you're starving. I picked up Kyle from him and settled him on my lap while Theo got started on his dinner. Delicious as usual, babe, he complimented. I smiled. Uncle Theo said Uncle Ko's food is delicious. Do you agree, Kyle Boo? I said, rubbing my nose against his small one. The baby yelped excitedly, his eyes as expressive as Nick's. He was one joyful baby, and the prospect of having one like him one day made my stomach somersault. My mind was once again occupied with having my own home with Theo someday, with many me's and many him's running around. We would chill by the backyard on hot summer days, Theo with a book on hand, while I busied myself with my embroidery. The children would be chasing each other and having a blast playing with their siblings, occasionally stopping to munch on some scrumptious and freshly baked pies I made and refresh with lemonade. I snapped out of my riviere as Kyle giggled once more, his attention now back to the television program in front of him while he fidgeted with his squishy ball. You'd make a good dad someday, love, I told Theo as I watched him chew on the food I made. He cracked a smile and gazed at me intensely. He simply stared at me, first my eyes, then my lips. So would you, he replied earnestly. Do you want to be one, one day, I mean? I asked sheepishly. You know how I felt about babies, love, he replied. His biological father was an abusive alcoholic who never expressed an inch of affection for Theo and his sister Tanya. He once told me that he shied away from any long-term relationship for this very same manner, which is why I feel quite apprehensive about our future. Although I was seeing a future with this man, I was not sure if he echoed my sentiments. I paused momentarily, not knowing what to utter because deep down my heart hurt at the prospect of one day losing him, simply because he was not ready to have a family, and I was. It has changed though, Theo said softly. When I met you, my heart skipped a beat and I raised my eyebrows, urging him on. I've never been with anyone who does not feel the need to change me. You know, my past relationships. They got me second guessing on who I was and if I was not enough. But you, you're so big on believing that I already got it in me. Like one day I will be an excellent father and with your words, I feel like I might actually be. I ruffled his hair, tearing up a little upon hearing his father. I knew what he meant. I understood his uneasiness. He did not want to end up like his father. He knew what being neglected as a child could do to you. While the notion of doing to his future kids what his father did to him engulfed his mind and throughout his adulthood, he was now seeing hope. He was seeing hope and a chance for a future for us. You'd make an excellent dad, Theo, I started. You're not your father. I've seen you with Kyle. I've seen you with Gab. I mean, your sister herself already said you'd make a great uncle and someday you'd make a great dad. You really think so? Wholeheartedly believe so, I said, as if in agreement, Kyle also squealed. Living under the same roof as your significant other had its perks, but it most definitely had its con too. Cohabitation meant developing intimacy quicker too, beyond just the sexual aspect of it. Sooner or later you'd be comfortable farting in their presence. Theo loved doing this. Thank heavens, his was normally odorless, otherwise I would really throw a pillow at his face whenever he did it in the living room as I watched television or scrolled through social media. You would feel comfortable going inside the toilet while the other is peeing, unfazed by the sound or the mere sight of them doing it. As a couple living together, we even developed our own routines and traditions, sooner or later. 
I normally still cooked, although I appreciated that Theo made an effort to cook some dishes. So far, I had tried teaching him how to make my signature soy glazed salmon, to no avail. Of course, he ended up overcooking the salmon, and the skin got stuck to the pan. I think I'm good in the dishwashing station instead, babe, he conceded. I laughed at his disheartened face. He evidently tried his best. He always did. Anything to the best of his ability. Theo was not Theo if he was not being overly competitive or simply putting his best foot forward. I squeezed his cheek and placed a soft peck on the side of his mouth. Well, keep trying, hun. He made salmon again later that week and almost perfected it. He truly was husband material. Get you a man who does not shy away from domesticated tasks and housework. He was a total winner in my books. Cuddles were still a pivotal part in our relationship. After all, it was where we started, wasn't it? We would sleep in either one's room. We decided to keep our separate rooms even after getting together as we respected each other's space. While we loved each other to death, we were still our own persons. The cuddles, however, were quintessential. I could not do without them, and to this day, I still ponder over how I survived the majority of my life without it. It would always start like this. He would go out of the shower, squeaky clean and smelling ever so masculine. He would flop down on the bed next to me, and then pull me closer with his strong arms. He smelled good, I would say, inhaling his scent and relishing the fact that I got to call this man mine, and that I spend every waking day next to him. He was the one I fell asleep next to and the one I woke up to. What a sight he was. He would then nuzzle his face into my neck, his five o'clock shadow at times poking my sensitive skin, but I loved the feeling of our skin's proximity nevertheless. It was almost primal. The skin-to-skin -skin contact was like a necessity to my being, and I have embraced the roughness of it. He would inhale my scent sharply and wrap his arms even more securely around me. When he felt playful, he would smack my ass and give me a full kiss, with tongue and teeth and all. Damn, he would say, while stroking my bum. On some nights, his hazel eyes would be full of mischief and we would result to a sexcapade all night long. Other nights, we would be content with just cuddling. Every now and then, I would inhale dramatically, wanting to be as close to him as possible and smelling every fiber of him. I could not get enough of him. I would shudder when he would graze my neck with his lips, ever so lightly, touching and teasing. We would stay like this until our eyelids felt too heavy and we succumbed to the dark night. I would rake my fingernails through his soft hair and he would close his eyes, letting out sounds of approval every now and then. He would intertwine his leg with mine until I was half straddling his thigh, and we would wake the following more like that, so close together that it appears that we were one being. I loved mornings with him. I treasured the routine that we have built together throughout the past few months of our developing relationship. He would usually be the first one out of bed. While he hopped in the shower, I would do some cleaning around the house, although we take turns in doing house chores. Most days, I would come up with a quick breakfast for us like bacons and eggs, while on other days he would surprise me with a poorly executed meal. I would relish it nonetheless because it came from the heart. Honestly, his food still had plenty of room for improvement, but I saluted his effort because I knew he genuinely wanted to learn how to cook for me. We were living like an old married couple. He would come into the kitchen with his tie undone, and I would pull him close for a kiss and fix his tie for him after. While I cooked, he would wrap his strong muscular arms around me and put his head on my shoulder, drawing in my scent and swaying with me side to side with whatever music was blaring in the background. We would go on our separate ways throughout the day and be slaves to the corporate, but I would endure this because I knew as soon as I got home, I was in for a night with my boyfriend. We took turns cooking. When it was his turn, he usually ordered takeout and enjoy a full meal together, babbling about how our respective days went and catching up on what we had missed out on. Our nights always ended by unwinding in front of our massive television, him reading a book and me watching whatever I felt like binging on Netflix that night. We were content. It was a blissful relationship indeed. It gave me something to live for. It gave me something to root for in the future. We need not say much on some nights. Some nights, we would just hold each other's hand while we did our own thing. Some nights, we need not utter a word to let the other person know that, hey, I'm here with you and I'm enjoying every second of it. And I sure hope that I could spend an eternity more with him. The Siblings Switch A night out could either turn into one of the best nights of your life or your ultimate regret. This party started off no differently, with my friends and I taking shot after shot and dancing along to the newest hits. I had to blow steam off this week, what with my job as a copywriter pushing me to my limits and my sister providing no comfort whatsoever whenever I was at home. My home used to be my sanctuary. I love my parents to bits, 
But lately, my older sister had been unbearable. I was not sure what was up her sleeves, but I sure wanted no part in her entanglement. She was problematic enough as it is. Anyone sitting here? A husky voice interrupted my train of thought. I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. Also because as soon as I landed my eyes on this fine specimen of a man, there was no way I could have done anything but gawk at him. He was gorgeous. There was no other way to describe it. Tall, lean, blonde, blue eyes. He looked like he came straight out of a dream. Use that line on everyone you see? He smirked and eyed me cautiously before taking a seat. Not quite, he teased. Not everyone meets my standards, you see. Cheeky. I took another shot of Bacardi and turned my gaze towards my friends who were all grinding all over each other's sweaty bodies on the dance floor. I loved my friend groups to bits, but since they were all couples, I could not help but feel quite left out at times, so I just decided to stay at the bar and down more shots. Likewise, the gorgeous man was downing his shots even faster than me, it seemed. Rough day, huh? I asked, trying to entertain myself. I was subtly hitting on this man, although I knew it was a long shot. There was no way a guy like him could pay attention to someone like me. Besides, he probably had a smoking girlfriend waiting for me. You could say so, he replied, once again, setting his deep blue eyes on me. You? Yep, work's been a pain in the ass, I said. You here with anyone? He smirked once again, showing a cute dimple that awakened my loins a bit. Nah. For tonight, I'll be that cliche guy that got cheated on and is drinking himself shit-faced. My mouth went agape a bit, and I softened, scooting a tad bit closer to the man. Oh, I'm sorry, I whispered. It's fine, don't let the party die because of me. We then spoke over a few shots, getting to know each other briefly and touching on our interests. I shared about how rough my past few weeks had been in the publishing house I worked at, given the recent change in our management. He was in awe that I was a writer and demanded that I show him some of my work. We were not tipsy. On the other hand, he was a chef at a fine dining restaurant called a Hamilton, downtown, and I promised him that I would give him a visit sometime if he made me a signature dish, which he claimed to be chili bacon polenta. We shared our love for books, and while we droned on about the latest crime novel he was reading, I quickly felt at ease with this man. Never have I felt comfortable sharing so much with a stranger I met so soon, much less in a club where pretty much everything was chaotic and obnoxiously loud. In this tiny corner of the bar, though, I found my peace. It seemed as though he shared my sentiments because he was swiftly opening up about his recent breakup. Perhaps because he felt at ease with me or the drinks were getting to both of us because we were also getting more and more adjacent and the atmosphere was heating up. Amidst my tipsiness, I knew that I was pretty much one scoot away from sitting on his lap. We were that close. I didn't see that coming, he shared, snapping me out of my riviere. Her cheating? I asked. He nodded, taking yet another shot. I could tell that off the bat that this man had a high alcohol tolerance, because if I drank half as much as he did during that short period of time, I would have been fast asleep by now. We were happy, you know, he replied. Or so I fooled myself into thinking. How were you guys like? I questioned curiously, trying to keep my anger towards his mystery girl at bay. She was always more aloof and cold. I was always friendly and romantic one, but somehow we made it work. But really, one of my co-workers? It's kind of fucked up, right? It really is, I said softly, swallowing a lump on my throat. This man deserved much better. For the past hour or so that we have been conversing, I could already infer that he was sincere and he had so much substance. Whoever this girl was, she sure was dumb for not only letting him go, but more so for hurting him. You deserve better. You seem like the type of guy to go to great lengths for a girl. Set up a romantic dinner, cook her comfort food, all that. You deserve someone who can reciprocate rather than hurt you like this. He stopped drinking at once, set his shot glass down and met my eyes. I swear I could melt under his intense gaze. His eyes were visibly blue, even with the bright dance floor lights and vivid spotlights interfering. My world seemed to come to a halt when his gaze landed on my full lips and he kissed me square on the lips. I found myself returning the kiss, and before I knew it, we were on a couch at another corner of the club, full on making out. Wanna get out of here? Hookups were definitely not my thing. Of all my friends, I had always been dubbed as the most behaved one. The one who did not drink with his dick, and the one who valued emotional attachments more than anything. So it was not surprising that until the next week, I had been thinking that one night stand I had, it was the best lay I've ever had, if I do say so myself. 
Plus, the man had a magnetic personality, and he gained my trust in just one conversation. I thought I made the right decision leaving his bed that morning, though. I did not want to be another stressor for him, and adding another person, aka me, to the equation would just complicate his already messy ordeal. Something bothering you, sweetie? My mom asked as she laid a tray of baked feta pasta on our table. We were having a family dinner for the first time in months, and my sister also announced the day before that she was bringing someone special with her. I shook my head and continued setting the table. Soon after, my sister arrived. I could tell because no one's voice could be as high-pitched. Plus, she was already bickering with her companion. Just stop, you already ruined it, she berated. I'm sorry, I was just hoping to bring something good for your family. I heard that familiar voice just as my sister appeared from the corner, rolling her eyes, exaggerately. I could not be mistaken. I had just heard that exact genuine and gentle tone days ago at the bar. This could not be happening. The man from the bar that I had a night stand with was here, in my family's home, with my sister. Mom, Dad, and you, said the bitch, eyeing me with the condescension she had always had for me. My boyfriend, James. He spotted me and stopped dead in his tracks, but recovered quickly and greeted my parents. When he approached me, I could not look him in the eye and instead focused my gaze on the painting behind him as we shook hands. This is not good at all. How was I having the best conversation with the man at a bar and subsequently sleeping with him just over a week ago and now my sister was introducing him as her boyfriend? It's all that. I got cheated on drama even real? Was he the one who cheated on my sister with me? These questions were lurking through my mind throughout dinner and I was semi-tuned out as James and my parents conversed. As usual, my sister Nadine was much too invested in herself. She had always been knee-deep in narcissism and was the queen of making everything about her. So it was no surprise that she was treating James like he wasn't even there. Luckily, my parents seemed genuine in wanting to get to know him. So they engaged him in meaningful conversation which had Nadine turning to her phone for entertainment throughout the dinner, instead. My mother smiled brightly. You seem like such a well-read man, James. I'm happy Nadine finally found someone who can match her intellect, she commented. I stifled a laugh. I had been quiet all throughout dinner, given my occasional nods and mm hmm but not really being my bright and cheerful self. It was awkward knowing that just days ago, I was in this man's arms, and now he was in front of me again, introduced as my sister's boyfriend. My mom then looked back and forth towards me and James, and for a split second, my heart stopped. My mom had always been the observant one, and I was terrified at the idea of her catching on to what was happening between me and James. My dad also gave me a knowing look, but thankfully did not say anything. I could not handle it anymore, with my parents praising him and cooing over James and my sister's relationship. I excused myself and headed to the patio, momentarily claiming that I had to take a work call. I breathed in and out repeatedly, staring at the starry sky and wondering how it would have felt if I was the one who had brought him home. How wonderful must that feel? It would certainly be better than being gnawed at by your guilt at the thought of being a third party to your very own sister's seemingly perfect relationship. Seth. I heard that voice. His voice was husky, but it was by no means rough. He sounded manly, without being intimidating. There was a tenderness to his demeanor, despite his hard exterior. I guess I was the fool, huh? Tell me, were you really cheated on that night? Was that just a cry for attention? I confronted him. He approached me and my heart softened when his eyes flashed hurt and confusion. What? Did you really get cheated on or did I become the third party between you and my sister? He shook his head rapidly and attempted to reach for me, but I moved away before he could. Seth, it was nothing like that. I'm hurt at the idea of you thinking that I used you and that I could ever cheat on anyone. Your sister and I have broken up for days when I met you at the bar. Everything I told you, I was nothing but truthful. Hell, I have never been more real to anyone than I was with you that night. I let on an audible sigh and felt a pang of relief. Sorry for even thinking that you're capable of cheating. You're much too good for that. He grinned. That was his first smile of the night, and that was the cause of his joy. It's all good, he replied. I'm sorry to put you in this awkward position, though. I never would have known you two are siblings. I understand. It was a one-night thing. You don't need to worry about it, I reassured him. Although deep down, of course, I was wishing it was not a one-night stand. How I wish I was the one who got to introduce him to my family as my significant other. It's true then, my sister was the one who cheated on you? He met my eye, but quickly looked away, as if ashamed. He nodded and swallowed a lump on his throat. 
Your sister's a tough one to deal with. Why did you stay with her then? Why did you go back? Familiarity, I suppose. She begged me to get back together with her and seeing her cry like that, it made me want to give her a second chance. I see how she treats you. Those subtle comments that she makes to belittle you. The way she ignores your presence as if you're not even in the room. She doesn't even deserve that second chance. He pursed his lips and I knew that I hit the bullseye. I kept thinking that maybe if I gave her one more chance, things would change. Maybe, I said truthfully. But I know my sister. She doesn't love anybody but herself. I'm starting to see it now. Why don't you leave then? I don't know, Seth. I don't know. You deserve so much better. One night I have known you, and I already know how much of a good man you are. How pure of a heart you have. Don't settle for anything less just because of familiarity or her manipulation. I'm trying, he whispered. Every time she says something and gaslights me, I want to stand up for myself so bad. But I cannot seem to do it. Whenever I think to how she cheated on me, my self-worth crumbles. It's the self-worth I have tried to build up for so many years. And all because of her, it's like I'm back to square one. What are you feeling is very much valid, I advised. But I don't think you deserve to get the blame for this. You don't deserve to feel like shit about yourself just because she's a narcissist and a terrible person. Do what's best for you, even if it's difficult. I wish it was that easy. You're stronger than you think you are, James, I convinced him. His eyes perked up as though I was the beam of hope he was looking for. You really think so? I nodded. I said as I put my hand over his and pat it repeatedly. The next week I was just leaving for work when I spotted a familiar silhouette outside my building. Seated on one of the benches was James, clad in a tight white shirt and a leather jacket. He was holding up a bag from Loretta, my favorite bakery. Hey, he greeted, standing up and walking towards me. Hey, what are you doing here? I asked as I gave him a tight hug. I was waiting for you. Brought you some of that cinnamon roll you were talking about over dinner the other day, he mentioned. After the rather awkward first meeting with my parents, James went back to our house thrice already to have dinner. And those three other times, it was magnificent. My mom cooked her immaculate dishes, my dad brought in drinks, and the four of us shared excellent dinners without my sister. How thoughtful, I gushed. Thank you so much. He nodded and said, let me walk you home. We then took a stroll. Refreshing the cool breeze off that late afternoon and enjoying each other's company in general. We small talked about our day and he told me about finally getting a Bichon Frise earlier that day. I was pumped for him seeing as he had been holding back from getting one since my sister hated dogs. How come she finally relented? I asked, referring to Nadine, who surely would have raged upon the sight of a small dog turd. I ended things. I stopped dead in my tracks and it seemed like my heart was racing at lightning speed. Deep down, I was ecstatic for James. He deserved better, and despite the entanglement that we were caught in, what with him being with my sister and me having slept with him, he was my friend. I found comfort in him, as he did with me. I had to pretend I was not over the moon, though. After all, despite my sister's atrocious attitude, it seemed like James loved her at one point. If he were melancholic about this, I would be there for him. I would share his sorrows. I'm so sorry to hear that, James, I offered, my words of comfort. Don't be, he said, smiling weakly. I followed your advice and your words truly strengthened me. They empowered me to stand up for myself and to not take any of her shit anymore. I'm glad to hear that. You happy then? I said. He nodded profusely. I am. I feel like I've broken free from the shackles, you know? Like I could be whoever I want to be. I could eat whatever I want without being told it would destroy my physique. I could gush over books and comics and my passions without being dubbed as immature or nerdy. I felt a tinge in my heart knowing how horribly my sister had treated this kind man. I'm happy for you and I hope you find happiness. Yeah, I hope so too, he said softly, looking at me very intently, and his blue eyes seemingly piercing right through me. I want to ask you something. A thousand thoughts were racing through my mind. Could this possibly be it? Go out with me, he whispered gently. It doesn't have to be now. It doesn't have to be tomorrow. I'm willing to wait. You have shown me kindness, love, and made me feel emotions that I did not even know I was capable of feeling. Before you, I have never even questioned my sexuality, let alone consider the idea of sleeping with another guy. But then you came into my life, and I thought, the void that I have been trying to fill for years, 
but could not quite get just right yet. You filled it so easily. I've been looking for you, and now that I found you, I don't want to let you go, Seth. James, I started pulling him close and giving him a tight hug. I don't know what to say, except I want to be with you too. He pulled away and then touched the tip of his nose with mine, once again gazing intensely at me. His eyes made me weak, but once he smiled and his deep dimples appeared, I was a goner. It's going to be messy. Your sister's probably going to throw a fit, but I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be with you, he said. Not long later, my parents soon found out about my sister cheating on James. Nadim admitted it herself in an accidental outburst. I cheated on that poor excuse of a man, she shouted at the dinner table. It was only the four of us that night, and my parents were prying about her and James' breakup. They were raving about how James was such a kind man and how they missed his jolliness around the house. And I suppose Nadine could no longer take it. She despised the idea of her own family favoring her ex-boyfriend over her, I suppose. To say that my parents were disappointed was an understatement. They berated Nadine thoroughly, and of course, she could only sit there with her shins up. Even while being scolded like she deserved, she still had a massive ego and pretended to be unbothered. You could live a thousand lives and not deserve that man, my mother told her pointedly. He truly deserves better, said my dad, and I'm glad that he's found his happiness in your brother. What? said Nadine and I concurrently. I was beyond shocked, of course, that my father knew, and Nadine was seething, of course. My pathetic poor excuse of a brother, spat Nadine, glaring at me from across of the table. Never getting shit for yourself, are you? That's why you were settling for my leftovers? Don't speak about James like that. He's great and a kind man, I retaliated. Don't waste your energy on her, Seth, said my mother, extending her hand and enveloping my shaking hands with her comforting ones. My dad had enough of Nadine's mouth and spoke for all of us. Your brother is treating James better than you ever have, and you will never will. Get out. You know, Dad? I asked, still in confusion, after Nadine walked out of the house and slammed the door shut. Of course I do, sweetie. I was just waiting for you to be ready to tell me and your mom yourself. But James has also already asked for our permission, which is why we hold him in such high regard. That man truly loves you and is willing to fight for you. We're happy for you, sweetie, my mom added. I could feel tears welling up in my eyes. My parents accepted me and James. They supported us and I could not be any more elated. The best revenge now, I suppose, would be to go on a family vacation, my dad cheered. Me, mom, and James. No Nadine in sight. From bromance to lovers? I am a 20-year-old guy who has just recently moved to the city. For the first couple of weeks, I was living with a friend, but now I have found an apartment to share. It is nothing too impressive, but the rent is good and it is clean, so I like it very much. I share it with my roommate, Chase. I do not have many friends in the city, so Chase and I quickly became friends when I moved in. He and I liked the same movies and had similar hobbies, so we got along just fine. In fact, we grew really close. One day, I had just got home from work and I was making some noodles to eat. Chase was in his room, playing guitar. It was Friday night, but I had nowhere to go. Work kept me busy, so I was unfamiliar with where the latest clubs or spots to hang out were located. I wanted to unwind on that day, so I decided to ask him if we could go out. I finished eating my noodles and made my way to his room. I knocked once and entered. He was playing a song that was very familiar to me. It was Would You Fight For My Love by Jake White. It was a song that had been a favorite of mine for several years. He stopped playing and looked up to me. His bouncy, curly hair fell in his green eyes as he did that. He smiled when he saw that it was me. Hey Simon, what's up? He asked. Nothing much man, just wanted to ask if you want to go out tonight. I'm a bit bored and would like nothing more than to get out of this house, I said. He scrunched up his eyebrows as he thought for a moment. Sure. That's not a bad idea. Let me call James and Kyle. I think they'll want to join us, he said. Sure, dude. That's cool. I really need a cold one at the moment, I smirked. Stress from work? He asked. Yep. I was the bookkeeper at a local store and it was that time of the year when I had to make sure everything was in place due to the impending auditing. I had just finalized all the books that afternoon and I really needed to chill. I was so damn tired. 
Yep, this was the week from hell, I said, sitting down on his bed. Oh, poor baby. He opened his arms for me. I went in for a hug. He was a very affectionate person, so I could always count on his hugs when I had a bad day. As time went by, we were just getting closer and closer. Thank you, I said, inhaling his musky scent. He always had the nicest smelling cologne. There, there. Next week will be much better, he said reassuringly. Thanks, Bunny, I said. Bunny was my nickname for him. His one for me was Cupcake. He named me that because I am obsessed with cupcakes. It was a bit funny, I know. But what could I say? He brought out the goofy part of me. I went to go and take a shower since it was scorching hot outside and I felt as if I would melt into a puddle right then. After the shower, I finally felt as if I was not trapped in the seventh circle of hell. I wrapped my towel around my waist and made my way to my room. As I turned the corner, I bumped into someone. I tried to break my fall, but in doing so, my towel fell to the floor instead. Chase looked at me with startled eyes. I was standing there, naked in front of him, and he was looking at me. I suddenly felt nervous as his gaze traveled down my body. I blushed and leaned down to pick up my towel. Oops, sorry I was not looking where I was going, he said bashfully. Nah, it's okay, I'm also at fault. I smiled sheepishly. We both laughed and carried on where we were going. I felt tingling in all that spots that he had looked at. This was new. I thought I was just embarrassed because my towel had fallen. I opened my door and slammed it behind me. I then went to my closet to look for something to wear. Since it was a hot day, I decided to wear my white shorts, my vans, and my white shirt. I quickly brushed my hair. I had gone for a haircut last week so it did not take me long to brush it. As I was putting away my comb, my phone pinged with a notification. I went to open it and saw that it was a message from Holly, a girl I had been texting. She worked at the coffee shop opposite my workplace, and I had met her when I had gone to get coffee. She was really pretty with the classic blonde hair and blue eyes. I had been texting her for a week now. I was thinking of asking her out next week so that we could hang out and see if there was any chemistry there. Holly. Hey you. Me. Hey ya. Holly. Guess who is having cupcakes? Me. Not fair. Why do you tempt me so much? Holly. Cause you like it when I tease you. I sent her a laughing emoji and put my phone in my pocket. Just then, there was a knock on the door. I went to open it and saw two guys with red hair who looked the same. I figured that they were twins. Hey dude, you must be Simon. I'm James and this is my brother Kyle, one of them said, gesturing to the other guy. Hey guys, I said giving them hugs. They came in and I went to call Chase. I knocked on his door but I got no answer. I called his name and a response came from the direction of the bathroom. I figured that he was taking a shower. So he's taking a shower, can I get you anything while you wait? I asked. Nah, we're good for now, our real thirst is for something strong. The one I assumed was James said. When you looked closer, you could see a few differences between the two of them. James was taller and more buff than his brother. Kyle had a scar under his left eye. At first glance, you would think that they were exactly alike. So, how do you know Chase? I asked. He's my ex, Kyle said. I raised an eyebrow. I knew that Chase was gay. He had told me that the very day I moved in. He had wanted to be transparent and to make sure that I was not going to have a problem with his sexuality. Finding out that about him had not affected how I saw him in the slightest. He was still the cool dude who loved guitars for me. What I was surprised about was that he was friends with his ex. That sort of thing was rare. I was civil with most of my exes and I could not stand the rest. It surprised me that he would actually hang out with his ex. Yes, I know. You're surprised. How could he land a bombshell like me? It was donkey years ago and we were much better as friends, he said. Oh, cool then, I grinned. How long have you been in the city? James asked. Six months. It took a bit of getting used to, but I really like it so far, I said. Chase mentioned that you had not experienced the nightlife here. We're going to baptize you tonight. Kyle grinned mischievously. 
I felt it real as I thought of all the possibilities. The night was young. Where would we be by the end of it? Not knowing thrilled me to no end. Yes, you heard right. You will be drenched in liquor, Simon's deep voice said. I turned to look at him and saw that he was dressed in all white, just like me. His olive skin looked gorgeous paired with the white. He winked at me and I grinned at him. Well, let us commence then, I laughed. Everyone joined me in the laughter and we were off. We started at a modest pub. There were a few people who had clearly just got off work and were drinking away their sorrow. Yes, that was what we had come here to do tonight. What can I get you gents? The barman asked. Shots please, Chase said. Coming right up. We sat on the stools and waited for him to make our drinks. There you are, he said, putting down four shots in front of us. We each took our shots and downed them. I savored the feeling of liquor burning as it traveled down my throat. This was the perfect start to the night. My gaze met Chase's and we did not break eye contact. We just stared at each other. He had this unreadable expression on his face that confused me. Lately, I would catch him looking at me out of the blue. It was very strange yet enticing. It was very strange, the things that were going on with him. We were very touchy with each other, holding hands, cuddling, etc. But I penned it down to a close friendship. But I knew deep down there was something more brewing. I just did not know what it was. We went from bars to clubs, chasing down the night. We drank everything that was offered talking and having fun like the night would never end. I wished that it would not end. We danced till our legs felt like they were made of stones. Those guys could party hard. I had never had such wild friends before, but I loved it. We were so drunk to the point of singing when the Uber dropped us back home. I unlocked the door and Chase and I got in. We waved goodbye to the twins and closed the door behind us. I felt the ground swaying when we entered. Hey, I think I need to sit down. I giggled. Sitting on the couch, it felt like the comfiest piece of heaven. He sat down beside me and put his head on my chest. For a while, we sat like that, comfortable with each other. You are the comfiest pillow ever, Cupcake, he said. His voice vibrated in my chest, sending tingles right down to my toes. Thanks, Bunny, I said, smiling. I like you, he said, and I like you. I caressed his curly hair. No, I really… I did not hear the rest of the sentence because I fell asleep. The next morning, we were both nursing a hangover from hell. We spent the whole day in our respective rooms, sleeping. It felt terrible. I swore that I would never drink again, but that was only until I was feeling much better. The next days were a bit awkward between us. I did not know why he was avoiding me. Whenever I talked to him, he would give short replies and scurry off. It was a bit strange because he was not a shy person at all. He was confident, loud, and proud. I decided that I was going to confront him. I missed him. I missed talking to him and getting up to no good with him. He was my best friend. No, I was lying to myself. There was something more that I could not put my finger on. I was going to get to the bottom of it no matter what. So then, one day, when I got home from work, I went straight to his room. I knocked once, but he did not answer. I had raised my hand to knock again, but at that moment, he opened the door. His hair was messy and his eyes unfocused. His skin was deathly pale as well. It looked as if he was ill. Bunny, are you okay? You look very pale, I said putting my hand on his forehead. He flinched back and took a step back from me. Hey, what's wrong? I asked him. Nothing. Did you want something? He could barely look me in the eyes. Yes, I want to talk to you about something, I said. Okay, give me two minutes. I will come to the living room, he said. I nodded and left him standing there. I sat on the couch, impatiently tapping my feet. I was very nervous for some strange reason. I hoped that I had not done something to upset him. He came out a few minutes later with his hair looking less messy and with a different t-shirt on. He sat down on the other edge, as far away from me as possible. So I wanted to know, why are you acting so distant towards me? 
Is everything okay? I cut straight to the chase. Yes, everything's fine. He said in a dismissive voice. No, it is not. Did I do something to offend you? I asked. He turned to look at me. It was then that I noticed that he had circles under his eyes. This made me suspect that he was having trouble sleeping. No, of course not, Cupcake. His eyes were haunting, filled with pain. Then why are you so cold towards me? I asked. I cannot tell you. His reply was short. Tell me, I said. No, he replied. Yes, I said. I love you. He suddenly burst out. Tears started falling down his cheeks. I was flabbergasted. I was speechless. I just looked at him as his shoulders shook and tears fell down his cheeks. His revelation awoke something with me, something that I thought did not exist. My mind went blank and all I could hear was my heart. You love me, I said silently. He just kept on crying. I like you as more than a friend. I am falling for you too, I said. As soon as I said those words, something within me loosened. I did not know when, but I had fallen for him. He stopped crying and looked at me with something like joy in his eyes. He hugged me until I could not breathe. I melted into it. It was perfect. I'm still trying to figure out my feelings, but I want to do that with you, I said. I am willing to be patient, he said. I'm afraid of starting this relationship. I'm also afraid of how my parents will react to this, I said. I get it. I will be there with you every step of the way. So then, we started dating. We took everything slow. We focused on getting to know each other and figuring out everything. We were not exclusive, as I was afraid about how people would treat me. But he was patient with me. A few months later, I was fuming, sad, scared disappointed in every other emotion I could feel under the sun. I could not believe that the person I cared about the most was giving me an ultimatum. He was doubting my feelings for him when I jumped through hoops for him. I knew that this would end in tears. I would pay dearly for who I loved. I could not believe that he posted a picture of us on Facebook and tagged me. Now everyone knew that I was gay. He said that he could not understand why I was mad because we loved each other. He had promised to be patient with me. Now, it was as if I was holding him back. I was so sorry that I could not be the perfect boyfriend for him, but I was done with this. I was not ready to have to explain myself to friends and family members about who I was. My parents were conservative. They would never accept a person like me. I could already see the disappointed look in my father's eyes. I did not know what I was thinking trying to be my true self. Sooner or later, my house of cards was bound to come tumbling down and everyone would know. I should have just ignored how I felt or told him that I did not feel the same way, but I had to go chasing happily ever afters. Now I had to leave against my will. Either this or my family was going to disown me. Did you ever love me? He said, his voice cutting me like dagger. He looked like his whole world had just exploded. I was responsible. I love you more than I can even begin to fathom, but I cannot be the one for you. You deserve a person who can proudly hold your hand in front of people, someone who can shout your name from the highest tower. I want to be that person, but I cannot, I said, turning to walk out the door of our apartment. If you walk away now, you're taking my heart with you, he said, and I will leave mine with you, my dear bunny. I gave him a peck on the lips and walked away without turning around again. His sobs accompanied me down the stairs as I walked away. I was going to have to deal with this mess that I had created and convince my parents that I was not gay or I would lose them. It felt like a walk to the guillotines, but a person walking to the guillotines would be much happier than me in those moments. From Romance to Lovers Part 2 it had been several months since I saw him. The wounds feel as fresh as if my heart was ripped out just yesterday. I could not see beyond the misery that I was in. I needed him. He was the one who made me happy. But I could not go back. I was on probation with my parents. I couldn't risk seeing him. I had been staying at their house for a while now. I had tried my hardest to convince them that I'm not gay. 
They were coming around, but I could not help but feel as if I was doing the wrong thing. Why did I have to hide who I loved? Does it hurt them that I am in love with a man? I could not fathom why they were so homophobic. Every day was a battle. I woke up every morning expecting to be back in my room. Instead, I was with the gray walls of my room. I woke up and went to take a bath. Then I went to work. Luckily for me, my parents hired me in their company. I thought that it was so that they could keep their eyes on me. One day, I'm doing the books when there is a knock on my office. I looked up and for the first time in forever, my heart was filled with joy. Standing in front of me is my sister Jennifer. I jumped up and rushed to give her a hug. She squealed as she hugged me tightly. I had not seen her in over a year. She and I are very close. I was so glad to see her. Oh my, what are you doing in this part of the world? I asked her once she had taken a seat. Just visiting, I heard that you were back home so I thought to come and see you. I do get tired of traveling sometimes. It is nearly Christmas so I came back to spend some time with my family. And you? What has been going on with your life? She asked me. Moved out, stayed in the city for a while, and came back. There is not much of a story, I said. Oh, and how are you managing a long-distance relationship? She asked. What are you talking about? I said. I saw the photo you were tagged in on Facebook, she said, raising an eyebrow. Oh, no, that was just a prank, I said, looking down. I know when you were lying. She arched her eyebrow. Damn, she was right. She knew me more than anyone in the world. She could tell me when I was unhappy, even if I was smiling. That was the amazing thing about her. Right now, this was bad for me. So then I told her everything, without leaving out anything. She kept a cool and calm face throughout the whole conversation, as I told her how I had to leave the man I loved because of her parents. Oh my, I was wondering how mom and dad react to the whole thing. They are a bit old-fashioned, but I hate seeing you like this. It doesn't matter to me who you love, I just want you to be happy, she said, holding my hand. Thank you, you're so kind. I wish that our parents shared the same view as you, but alas, they do not accept me for who I am. I'm lucky they didn't send me to a reform institution. Right now, I'm just keeping my head down. I shrugged. For how long? Until they force you into an arranged marriage? She asked. They will cut me off if I dare to defy them, I said. So you're willing to let go of a person you love because of two people who are not happy about who you love? I just feel like you have made a big mistake, she said. I thought about what she had said for a moment. She was certainly not wrong there. I had been apart from someone I loved because of my parents. If they loved me so much, then why did they treat me as if I was their puppet? I loved them, but this was enough. If I did not break away now, then I was going to spend the rest of my life miserable. This was going to drive me to an early grave. I could not let them do that. You're right. Chase has made me feel like I have never felt before. He has been kind to me. He has been patient. He made a mistake when he posted that picture, but who can blame him? We should be allowed to date in peace, I said to her. I got out my phone and started searching for the earliest flights out of my town. I saw that there were none today. The earliest one was tomorrow. I quickly booked it. Tonight, I would say my goodbyes to my parents and tell them how I felt about Chase. How they took it was not my problem. Jessica told me that she had to go and meet her friends for some shopping. I finished up the work that I was doing and made my way home. When I got there, I went to my room and freshened up. I then started packing all of my clothes. I did not think that I was going to come back to this place again. I had a feeling that my parents were not going to take kindly to the news that I was about to tell them. After that, I texted them to ask if they were home. This house was huge. It was impossible to find anything or anyone here. They texted me back to let me know that they were home. I told them that I needed to talk to them about something. We agreed to meet in my father's study. I found them sitting there, discussing the latest markets. They were all about business. I walked in and took a seat beside my mother. 
Hello, son. You said you wanted to talk to us about something, my dad said. Yes, dad. I wanted to talk to you about something important. I am leaving for the city, I said. His eyebrows went up. I was afraid that they would fly through the roof. My mother gasped and looked at me in disbelief. I knew that they were going to be shocked. But we decided that you're not going back there. You were nearly corrupted by that gay. She started. I did not let her finish the sentence. You decided. You chose for me. You did not care how I felt about the whole thing. So do not pretend as if you care all of a sudden. I was not corrupted. I fell in love, I said. You will not speak to your mother like that, Simon. No son of mine will be in a relationship with a man. Is that clear? My dad said, pounding his fist on the table. I knew that he was going to be like this, but it did not feel great to hear him say such hurtful words. It does not matter what you think. I love Chase. If you consider me to be your son, then you will accept that. I have nothing more to say, I said. Get out of my house, my dad roared. Dad, please stop, a voice suddenly said. We turned around to look at the door. Jessica was standing there. You did not hear what he was saying. Stop defending your brother. I want him out, my dad said harshly. Dear, are you not being too drastic? I am sure we can talk this through, and soon he will see my reason. My mother pleaded with him. Do not waste your breath, mother. I have no choice but to leave, I said, getting up. At least let him stay until tomorrow morning, Jess begged. Fine, but I do not want to see his face tomorrow. You will leave this house early in the morning. He turned to look at me. I nodded, then left the room. It was late and I was tired. I asked one of our maids to bring the food to me. I was not up for an awkward family dinner. The next morning, I was out of the house before my parents were up. The only person I said goodbye to was Jessica. She drove me to the airport and waited for me to board the flight. I did not deserve her kindness, to be honest. She was too kind for her own good. The flight felt like the longest six hours of my life. I felt as if I would never get there. I was so nervous about what would happen when I finally saw him. I really hoped that he would be able to forgive me. If he was unable to, I would be shattered. I finally landed a few hours later. I called an Uber to drive me to our apartment. According to James, whom I had spoken to yesterday, he was still staying there. He had not rented out my room despite the many offers. That made me think that there was hope for us yet. I went up the stairs and knocked at the door. I really hoped that he was home. Otherwise, I was going to have to find somewhere else to go while I waited for him. I didn't know how he was going to react seeing me there. I was certain that he was going to be very upset with me. He had every right to be. I had left him. The door opened to reveal him. The first thing I noticed about him was that his hair was now blonde. It looked good on him. In fact, he looked even more gorgeous than I remembered. He looked at me in shock. Then I watched as his eyes hardened and he slammed the door in my face. Yep. I deserved that. I knocked again. To my surprise, he opened the door. Come in, he said. His voice. I had missed his voice. My body reacted to hearing his voice. I felt as if I had been electrocuted. Why did he have to make me feel this way? I followed him to the living room. Everything was just as I remembered. I felt as if I had never left. But yeah, I had left him. Would he ever forgive me? I sat down on the couch and he sat beside me. First of all, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for everything that I put you through. I was under so much pressure from my parents. I did not want them to disown me. I started. So you decided to stomp on my heart instead? He asked. You did not deserve that. I realized that I was wrong. I said. You left me with a hole in my heart. I did not expect you of all people to make me feel like I did. He said, I know it was messed up. I'm so sorry. I said, it's okay. I forgive you. I can never stay mad at you. What about your parents? Do they know that you're here? He asked. No, actually, the whole thing is complicated. I'm feeling so many conflicting feelings at the moment. My whole life, I believed that I knew who I was. 
but now I do not, I said. I get it. I experienced that when it came out. But for you, it is probably worse because you do not have your parents' support. I promise that I will do anything I can to help you. We can take this as slow as you would like. We will work through this together. Yes, together, I said. So we did that. He helped me by booking therapy sessions with me and spending time with me. Eventually, I saw that the therapy sessions were helping. I found myself feeling more comfortable with each session that I attended. I became more comfortable with my sexuality as well. Things with him were going well. I felt as if I was on cloud nine. He was the sweetest person that I had ever met. When I was with him, I could be anyone that I wanted to be. We would go on cute dates all the time. We always made sure to go out every Friday night and on our off days. We had conversations about everything. From our upbringings to pop culture, we never ran out of stuff to talk about. I fell more and more in love with him every day. But there was something strange about the whole relationship. We loved being affectionate with each other, but we had never kissed. I figured that he was being patient with me. One day, we were baking cupcakes for his little sister's bake sale at school. His mom was working a night shift, so she could not do it. Layla was in Chase's room playing games on his computer. Pass me the sprinkles, please, I asked him. When it came to baking, I was pretty good at it. He looked at me, then giggled. I frowned. I wondered if everything was all right. And then, I asked him. He leaned into me. I figured that the moment had come he was finally going to kiss me. Imagine how disappointed I felt when you wiped my nose. He showed me his hands and I saw that it had some flour. I blushed from embarrassment. There I went, making assumptions again. I'm not done yet, he said. I turned my head and his soft lips locked with mine. My body tingled as he kissed me for the first time. It felt so good as if I was drinking water for the first time in a long time. He caressed my hair as he kissed me. I pushed him towards the counter and deepened our kiss. We kissed without coming up for air. We finally broke apart after a while. I have been wanting you to do that for a long time, I said. A year later, it was Valentine's Day and I was feeling very happy. I had just had the perfect day with my bae. We went to our restaurant and had some sushi. I could not take my eyes off him for the whole meal. He looked so darn appetizing. I could see it in his eyes that he desired me too. The sexual tension between us had been heating up lately. I figured that it was because it was the month of love. I felt as if I was ready to take the next step with him. From the signals that he had been giving me, it was clear that he was ready too. After dinner, we went back to our place. It was a bit hot, so I took off my shirt and walked around without it in the house. He was working in the living room while I had some ice cream. He kept on looking up and gazing at me. I could see that he desired me. I licked the ice cream while giving him a sultry look. I could see his eyes darkened as he stripped me with his eyes. I wonder who was going to break first between me and him. I was patient. Are you okay, babe? I asked in a sexy voice. Yes, why don't you come here and sit by me? He said. Gotcha. I smirked and came to sit by him. He did not look at me again though. I pouted as I wondered why he had called me there in the first place. He was such a tease. He knew that I was getting hot and bothered in his presence. Well, two can play at that game. I was going to show him. I rested my hand on his knee and I could have sworn that I heard him gasp. My hands traveled further up his leg, and his breath shortened. Enough, he growled, placing his laptop on the table and carrying me in his arms. I smirked as we entered his room. I felt so hungry for him. I needed him. He threw me on the bed and began removing his clothes. I swallowed as I saw how hard he was. I was excited, yet nervous. What was he going to do to me tonight? I could not wait to find out. He started kissing me as his hands touched me all over. I moaned as I became more aroused. He bit my lower lip and I gasped. I pulled at his hair as he kissed me more passionately. He began unbuckling my pants as I kissed him on his neck. 
I needed every part of him within me at that moment. He looked at me with lust-filled eyes and said to me, Are you ready? He asked. His eyes were suddenly filled with concern. I frantically nodded. I could barely speak. The lust was rolling through me in strong waves. Good. Tonight, you will be mine, he said. So then, I was his. I have never had so much pleasure while being intimate with someone. He made me feel things I had never thought of before. He wielded my body like a sword. When we finally reached the climax together, it was electric. My whole body felt like it was on fire as we rode it out together. We collapsed next to each other due to tiredness. I laid my head on his shoulder and took a moment to breathe. That had been so amazing, I could barely move. I love you, I said. I love you too, he said, kissing my hair. So then we made love again and again. We could barely get enough of each other. And you say you're not romantic. I have never been a romantic. All my life, I have been the quiet and intimidating guy. The always observant individual at the back of a room. Normally brooding and not that approachable. I suppose that this is why girls in high school and even in college rarely approached me. Every now and then, one musters up the courage and asks me out. But they were merely flings. I preferred to keep to myself minding my own business and simply going with the flow. Although I did have a few romantic ventures throughout my life as a student, they were fleeting. As the saying goes, it was fun while it lasted. I was a hormonal teenager after all. Despite my hard exterior, my inner self was a thrill seeker so it was not surprising that I had my fair share of fun with various girls. Even now as I reach my mid-twenties, I do not think I have found the love that truly ignited my soul. You know the electric and passionate kind of love that they portray in movies. Despite being mistaken as someone with no heart and emotion because of my misleading exterior, I admired that kind of burning red, head over heels, passionately in love kind of dynamic. I did not think I was capable of sharing a bond like that with anyone. Not now. Not ever. But I derive pleasure every now and then from witnessing other people sharing that type of love and daydreaming if I ever will experience one. So much for being brooding and looking emotionless. Why am I getting all sappy? I suppose it is also one of the side effects of isolation. Perhaps being trapped in these four walls is making me long for company I never thought I would ever need. I used to find being surrounded by people exhausting. Although I was somehow sociable, definitely with the lads, I never truly craved companionship the way I do nowadays. That is why dating and romance in general have been common topics between me and my close friend and roommate, Louis. Louis was the polar opposite of me. While I was the intimidating and unapproachable guy, he was a social butterfly, an old school friendly soul with a knack for all things pretty. He also adored going to the gym, which was where we met. I had just moved into the small city of Ilvermorny and applied for a gym membership in Carlos, a small independent gym downtown. We had casually passed by each other during our workout sessions previously. But only two months in of amiably nodding and smiling towards one another did we make small talk. I was not one for small talks and casual, random friendships blooming from the gym. But his aura was too strong. I did have a lot of guy friends, but no one quite had Louis's energy. It was almost as if his inside reflected on his appearance. His hair was golden, often unkempt, and his eyes a deep blue. He looked like the embodiment of light and all things happy. Together, we made a stark contrast, and with his messy golden hair and eyes of the brightest blues while I sported tidy dark hair and chocolate brown eyes. But still, we clicked. Somehow it worked, like a magnetic force pulling us together, though platonically at first, we worked. Louis and I became regular gym buddies and would grab a meal every now and then after our workout sessions. Being new to Ilvermorny, I did not know many people besides some distant relatives so he also took the liberty of showing me around during his free time. Quickly, we formed a low-maintenance friendship. We did not feel the need to be around each other all the time. We were polar opposites after all. He was an extrovert who had a massive friend circle so he never really ran out of social gatherings to attend. I was an introvert who relished companionship every now and then, but did not really feel the need to surround myself with people all the time. Even as I found my footing in the new city, like going for occasional drinks with my workmates in the insurance firm that I worked at and having football nights with my neighbors, Louis and I still became regulars. Our close friendship was elevated when we decided to turn from casual friends to roommates one fateful night. 
We were packing up our gym bags in one of the stuffy and badly lit locker rooms of Carlos after an intense leg day when Louis brought the topic up. You ready for the month-long lockdown? He said, sitting on the bench across from me. I was emptying my locker into my blue Nike gym bag since it will be a while since I will see this rundown gym again. It was not the most aesthetically pleasing place and could use some repair here and there. But Carlos felt like home after months of being here. I met Louis here, after all. I cackled. You mean, am I ready to go back to my usual hibernation? But this time with an impressive stockpile of food. Yes, yes I am. He laughed and shook his head at my usual introvertedness. He must know that I was impartial about the lockdown as the lack of company never fazed me. Sometimes, I wonder how you live. He replied jokingly. Bold of you to assume that I live at all. I retorted. True. A grumpy old man stuck in an adult's body? He joked. I could not help but notice. The way his eyes crinkled when he smiled genuinely. I swiftly brushed it off though and rolled my eyes playfully. He watched me with calculating eyes as I continued folding my gym clothes into my bag. I raised my eyebrows at him, prompting him to tell me his thoughts. I knew that scrutinizing gaze well enough. He was deep in thought. You're just gonna stare at me or what? I bantered. What do you think of living together? I did a double take, recovered, and then zipped up my gym bag. I sat down on the opposite bench and faced him. Care to elaborate? He was fidgeting with his car keys. He never fidgeted. Ever, you know, what with the lockdown and all. My roommate, Eric, is moving back to his parents and I was just wondering if, um, you know, you'd like to move in. Just for the month, he explained. Eric was this hotshot accountant and Louis's roommate of two years. As Ilvermorny goes into yet another stringent lockdown to combat the spread of the COVID-19 virus, Eric was moving back to his parents' place at Illinois since he was working from home anyway, leaving Louis to fend for himself. Louis's offer for me to move in did not come as a surprise though. For weeks, he has been hinting that being alone in isolation would wreck his extroverted soul. I suppose I could have been a better friend and offered company when I sensed it, but it just was not me to invite myself to places especially for the long haul. But being ever so observant and somewhat knowing Louis thoroughly despite only being acquainted recently, I had a feeling he longed for company. What came as a surprise though was his seemingly nervous tone. That was very unlike Louis or perhaps I was just reading too much into his body language. The brief pause must have made him nervous because he quickly tried to retract his offer. Only if you want though because if you don't and you're perfectly fine basking in isolation, then I can live with it for a month. You know, he said skittishly. No, no, I'm actually down for it. We wouldn't want your extroverted soul wrecked after the month's over. Right. I joked. And so we became roommates. Turning from casual gym buddies to friends to roommates is like a roller coaster. I have had my share of roommates before in college, but we paid no mind to each other then because all the guys and I were almost always out of our dorm anyway. Our shared dorm then seemed like it was merely for sleeping and showering. But after living alone for years and then suddenly having Louis as a roommate, much less in isolation, required massive adjusting. When I moved to Ilvermorny, I contemplated getting a roommate just to lessen my expenses and be able to save up more of my salary. It would have been useful just to have a local show me around, too. Although I ended up not really needing that since Louis came into my life and became my casual tour guide. But after agreeing to be roommates, I had to face the music. I could not just spend my days reading peacefully and not speaking to anyone. I suppose socialization is a cornerstone of having a nice and lively shared home. That is, if your roommate is half as talkative and outgoing as Louis. Theo, you've got to see this. That's a good deal, isn't it? Two for twenty dollars. And hey, they are large pans. He pointed animatedly to his iPad where he was browsing through the local pizza places. I smiled at his sheer excitement and put my book down momentarily to see the ad he found. When he was not working out or binge watching a new show. Louis would endlessly browse through the net for new takeout places to try our home-cooked recipes that he wanted to have. Correction, home-cooked recipes that he wanted to eat and wanted me to get me to cook. Between the two of us, I was the better cook. Quite frankly, I cannot fathom how he would have been able to survive if I had rejected his offer and he was forced to live alone. Perhaps he would be eating takeout every day. Come on, let's try this. My treat since it is my turn to cook dinner tonight anyway. He said sassily. That's hardly cooking, is it? I chuckled. Well, they have buffalo pizza. Your favorite? Right. So you better suck it up and thank me for the best dinner you will have although I didn't cook it. He patted my head and messed up my hair. A habit he has recently developed. A week into lockdown, we have developed our own little routine. We normally worked out together in his mini gym in the early morning. 
making our separate breakfast afterwards. He would then spend his day gardening, obsessively checking out his plants he called his green babies or what I dubbed as his love child with Shrek. When he got tired, he would wind down in the living room with a podcast or binge the shows he is currently obsessed with. At the moment, he is trying to get me to watch Dynasty with him. When I was not working on my computer, I would bury my head in a book in the living room as I snack on some healthy tidbits. And that was how we spent our days, just the two of us in the living room, with him browsing through the Netflix selection on the massive 65 inches television and me deeply engrossed in yet another novel. At night, we would take turns cooking, which basically means I cook on days assigned to me and he orders takeout on his days, and we share a peaceful meal. Some nights are more chatty while on others, we eat in silence contentedly. Time is odd. At times, it is fleeting. Other times, it is excruciatingly slow. But as Louis and I continued to live in our own little bubble, it began to feel like normalcy all too quickly. It seemed as though we have been living like this for ages, as though we were born to be like this. Platonic soulmates, he would say. But time also does this weird thing where it changes its fickle mind and swerves you to a different path once you begin to have a taste of contentment and have fallen into a routine. I am babbling, likely because to be writing this would mean I am acknowledging that something in me has been ignited. That one fateful day happened days ago. My work for the day had just concluded after a meeting with some of my bosses. To say that it was a bad day was an understatement. It was atrocious. The day started off with me oversleeping so that meant I missed an online conference with a particularly picky client that I had been trying to secure for weeks. I was so close to securing that deal. That was strike two. Strike two came around lunchtime. I had an hour break before my next virtual meeting so I dedicated the time to making Louis' favorite food, mushroom risotto. He had been gone the entire morning shopping for some essentials and I wanted to surprise him with the meal when he got home. Halfway through, an emergency at work required me to take a call for roughly 15 minutes. The risotto got overcooked and Louis came home to our smoked up kitchen. What the hell happened here? He said. He was not mad. Louis never got mad although I would like to think he had every right to since he religiously freshened up our place with his aromatherapy diffuser. His favorite scent was a tangy citrus. I was not a fan of it, but I went with whatever he liked. I dumped the blackened risotto into the trash can and proceeded to wash the teffel pan. Just overcooked some risotto, I replied softly. I bet he was about to make some smart remark until he noticed that I was looking quite downcasted. He then perched himself on a nearby counter and patted my back. Suddenly, I felt like a weight was lifted off my chest. As someone whose love language was touch, I appreciate a gesture as small as this. I went about my day after that dreadful meal. Thankfully, Louis had bought some rotisserie chicken from the grocery store. I had a crucial meeting at about 3 p.m. It was bad enough as is since our sales have gone down from the last month and I was among the worst performing employees. Securing the deal this morning would have been my redemption. But as I had overslept, that was out of the question. I ended up getting an earful from my superiors and after that meeting, my mind was much too clouded to cook dinner for me and Louis that night. After a long and appalling day at online work, I plopped down on the couch opposite Louis who was knitting. Chinese sound good to you. I'll call Lucky One in a bit if you want, I offered. Lucky One was a family-owned Chinese restaurant a stone's throw away from the gym that we used to go to. It was one of my personal discoveries after moving to Ilvermorny, and I introduced Louis to it shortly after we met. He raised an eyebrow and put down his crochet work at once. He moved over to the couch next to me, not once breaking eye contact. It was like he was seeing right through me with those intense deep blue eyes. You good. You have never offered to order takeout ever. He said slowly, as if calculating my mood. Shit day at work, I replied, looking over at him. I then proceeded to tell him about the failed deal and my boss's remarks about my performance. All the while, Louis propped his chin in the palm of his hand while listening attentively. He even patted my back as reassurance when my voice would crack slightly, evidently affected by the happenings of that day. Well, you were indeed dumb for missing that client call. I mean, you could have just told me. I was up at the ass crack of dawn doing that Pilates video I had sent you last night. He rolled his eyes. But, hey, hey, those comments by your stupid bosses. Out of the line. Uncalled for. They clearly don't know what they are saying. I cracked a small smile. Aware that my breathing was picking up as Louis's hand remained on my back, rubbing me up and down every once in a while. Ironically, instead of soothing me, I was getting nervous because of his touch. Your bosses don't know and don't appreciate what kind of talented and hardworking soul you are. I mean, beneath your robotic aura, you have this brilliant, brilliant man. 
He continued, don't let them dampen your spirit. I mean, sure, you may have had a bad month of sales, but it isn't for life right. You can always bounce back, T. And then that fateful moment happened. Long story short, he hugged me. I compare a lot of my real life experiences to how movies and books portray them but this was by far the most true to life. I never thought that slow motion moment of epiphany scene could happen to me, not until that day. As soon as our skins touched, there were electric sparks reverberating throughout my body, something I had never felt before. Not with him, not with the girls I have been with before, not with anyone. I looked up cautiously, aware of the goosebumps that had just formed on my skin. My eyes were met with the most vivid blue orbs, passionate, full of life, and oh, they belong to my good friend and current roommate. Immediately, I knew I was in trouble. He just chuckled. Well, I'm gonna forgive you for burning that mushroom risotto because you have had a shit day all right. He joked. Shit, shit, shit. I was surely in trouble. The nagging thoughts and foreboding whispers that I have been pushing to the back of my head for the past few weeks came flooding back into my memory. Like an avalanche, thoughts of Louis engulfed my mind. No longer did I see him as a casual gym buddy turned good friend and roommate, but something more. A myriad of feelings rushed to me and I was overwhelmed throughout that afternoon. As I cooked our dinner, chicken tikka masala which we both enjoyed to bits, my mind could not help but wander to the events of that afternoon and how my body, my mind, and most importantly, my heart reacted. Could it be that I was falling for him? I was beyond puzzled. All my life, up until this moment, I was under the impression that I was attracted to girls and girls alone. Could this be the reason why my other romantic ventures pale in comparison to how I feel when I was with Louis? How is it possible that a mere moment of realization that I might have feelings for him is proving to be more electric than the passionate and steamy nights I have had with other people in the past? That night, we had dinner across from each other as always. I had gained enough energy from being comforted by him so I opted not to order takeout and cooked instead. We savored the savory dish that I had cooked and he seemed to be over the moon about the food. He always did that when I cooked. He would make approving noises and savor every bite, occasionally swinging his utensils in satisfaction. I realized that night that my heart fluttered whenever I saw him smile. Come on, Theo, you have cooked for a lot of people before and they all love it. Do you react the same way when they give you such approval? I berated myself mentally. I suppose my silence was somewhat usual because sooner or later Louis noticed it. You're being awfully quiet. All good. Still reeling from this afternoon. He queried. I nodded and made an effort to keep the conversation flowing. I guess it is better to bottle up my emotions to prevent a sudden outburst and confession before I was able to fully comprehend what I was feeling. I knew that having feelings for a friend and a gay friend at that was unexplored territory for me. But I also knew deep in my heart that love had no boundaries. If the love that I have been waiting for all my life is coming at me full speed, there was no stopping it. At the back of my mind, I knew that I lacked the typical romantic demeanor that Louis has been accustomed to. I knew because he would babble about the guys he dated in the past and I knew for sure that I was not even half as romantic as them. The romance I knew was normally bounded in novels and cheesy rom-com movies. I did not embody that in real life and a part of me was afraid that Louis would crave that. Wait, what? Why is my mind wandering to how Louis will react to my confession? Was I even headstrong in making the confession in the first place? Was I ready? These were questions that clouded my head over the past couple of days. Try as I may, I cannot keep my mind off Louis. We would be sitting in our usual spots in the living room, him watching some Netflix show, and me supposedly reading. But I would find myself looking up from my book and watching him with hooded eyes. Even at dinner time, I found myself watching him for a moment too long as he savored whatever dish we were having that night. I found myself noticing the littlest details about him, features or habits that I had not paid attention to before. It seemed like everything he did or did not do was a trap for me and I found myself falling headfirst for him. And yet, even as I got overwhelmed with infatuation or whatever this was I was feeling for Louis, I found myself being ever so cautious around him. Our friendship was getting stronger by the day. I could not possibly ruin it by pursuing him to be something more, unless he felt the same way. True to keeping my feelings in check, I went about the following days without acting on my newly discovered feelings for Louis. Surely, I was more attentive than ever to his actions and how he reciprocated my gestures. I knew that whenever we were across each other in the living room, one knitting or watching television, and the other's nose was buried in a book, I had the tendency to look over at him every now and then and steal glances. But lately, I have been noticing that there were instances that I looked up and he was already watching me too. When caught, he would swiftly avert his gaze or give a small smile, 
as if brushing it off. I noticed that on days that I snoozed my alarm a little too much and did not have the time to make my bed immediately. I would return from my showers and find that my sheets were already tidied up. On the same days that I am running late for my virtual working hours, while I got dressed, fresh coffee was already brewing in the sleek Cuisinart coffee maker. Louis did not drink coffee. He always opted for tea so clearly, he prepared the coffee for me. These were little gestures that I did not heed, what I am now noticing. For a person so observant, you must think I have been ignorant towards these acts. Could it be that all along, there were clues that I missed, or there tiny acts of love that I did not see. These thoughts pondered in my head over and over again, but I choose not to dwell on them as much in the daytime otherwise I would get distracted while doing my online work. At nighttime, it was tough to push such wishful thinking aside, especially when he was so close in proximity, and the connection between us was so magnetic. One particular night, I could not help myself. He forced me to put down my book for the night and watch The Revenant with him. He went all out for the movie night, opening a pricey bottle of wine, a parting gift from his ex-roommate, Eric, apparently and ordering a small charcuterie platter from a place downtown. During a particularly horrifying scene when Leonardo DiCaprio was attacked by a massive bear, Louis at once clung on to me, shocked by the sudden turn of events. I felt my heart pounding against my ribcage and one thing was for sure. I was praying that Louis could not sense my nerves and all the butterflies in my stomach that have surfaced because of our proximity. Once the scene was over, he patted my head and messed up my ever so tidy brown hair. I rolled my eyes. Only he does that. No one really dared to tangle up my hair because it was always so immaculately brushed and styled. Don't do that, I whispered. That sure was a moment of weakness. He must have felt the intensity of my gaze because his smile disappeared at once, and he retreated further from me on the couch. Whoa there, Mr. Grumpy Pants. Why the sudden change of mood? He questioned. You, you cannot do that. You cannot move into my arms like that then suddenly move away. I crave your warmth. I want to hold you. I cannot focus when you touch me like that. Of course, I did not say all this. I was much too scared for his reaction and for rejection. I must say, in my life, I never truly pinned for anyone. Chasing a romantic conquest was new to me. I was a go-with-the-flow kind of guy. I was not built for romantic chases like this. And yet, with Louis, I found myself hoping. Hoping that something awaits us. Hoping that we may have a chance. Hoping, hoping, just newly styled. That's all, I brushed it off. He shrugged and we went back to the movie. It was pretty good, if I do say so myself. I was not one for violent and gritty movies, but a Leonardo film feels different. Part of me was also extremely relieved that he did not pry into my reaction any further. It was a moment of weakness and I should have known better. I needed to keep my emotions in check or just like my past relationships. My friendship and hope for a relationship with Louis will crumble. There were days when I could keep my feelings in check. By in check. I meant that I normally channeled my desire for any romantic connections with Louis in the romance novels I read during my free time. A particular book called The Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue got me in my feelings. Louis must have noticed because he kept teasing me and asking if I was able to relate to Monty, the main character. It did not help that a major plot point of the book revolved around Monty being in love with his best friend. The moment Louis brought it up and mentioned that he had read the book before, I knew I started flushing like crazy. You could be the Monty to my Percy, you know, he winked. I must have blushed even harder because he started laughing and said I looked like a tomato. You're cute when you do that, he said casually, squeezing my right cheek before walking right back to his bedroom. I tried to calm my breathing, but of course, my heart was fluttering uncontrollably. Moments like that made me feel like maybe Louis and I had a chance. Maybe, just maybe, felt the same way about me. These what-ifs plagued my mind as I laid in bed that night, and every other succeeding night if I am honest. The month-long quarantine was soon over, but it was announced that the city was only giving the people of Ilvermorny a week to prepare for the Christmas holidays before stricter precautions were in place again. I decided to stay in town for the holidays as my parents will be on a ski trip with a friend group in Alaska while my only other sibling, Tiffany, was spending it with her husband and in-laws. Louis was also staying and so that meant we only had each other for company during the Christmas time. On the first day after the month-long lockdown, we bundled up and headed to go tree shopping. I was decked out in a cashmere turtleneck and a black coat. I also wore a brown scarf that Louis had knitted for me a week ago while he binged the new season of Emily in Paris. He emerged from his room, clad in a stylish gray long sleeve and a similar scarf. You look nice, I said softly. He raised his eyebrows at me, evidently puzzled at my sudden compliment. What has gotten into you? He smiled. 
Thanks, you don't look so bad yourself, T. As we walked through Holt, the little Christmas tree village in Ilvermorny, the air felt heavy. There was palpable tension in the air, like an icicle threatening to crack anytime. It must have been one-sided though because Louis was his every jolly self, inspecting every little tree we passed by and making funny remarks. He was just babbling about the massive Christmas tree he had been decorating as a six-year-old when suddenly, it fell on him. I am not going to lie, but I did not understand much of his story. This was partly because he was talking so animatedly and excitingly fast that his speech was somewhat slurred. But it was mostly because I was just staring at him. All at once, I saw Louis, and I love every bit of him. The way his eyes were crinkling as he smiled genuinely, recalling his childhood. The way his hands flung here and there as he described what Christmas markets were like in his hometown, Hangleton. You know that final scene in the Twilight Saga, Breaking Dawn, Part 2 when Edward looked into Bella's eyes and took a trip down memory lane together as a thousand years by Christina Perry played in the background. That was how I felt at that very moment. I thought back to when I first saw Louis and Carlos, wearing his gray fitted added as tea. I thought about when we first had dinner together after an exhausting day at the gym. How he brought me to his favorite Mexican place in town and we talked for hours about our interests. I thought about the plenty of times I watched him from one corner of the living room as he knitted or crocheted, or whatever his obsession was for that week. I thought about how passionately he did everything he liked. I thought about how he tried to bake an apple pie for me when I had a particularly rough day at work and how it ended up being such a failure so he ended up ordering from Grandma Apple, a bakery in town, instead. But I appreciated it all the same. I still ate his burnt apple pie and thanked him profusely for it. I thought about the nights I brainstormed new recipes of dishes to cook for him because the flutter in my stomach and the joy that I felt when I see him relish my cooking was priceless. I thought about his likes, dislikes, his passions, his flaws, and realized that I could see a lifetime by his side. And you know, I was seven, of course I believed in Sant. I love you. I interrupted his story at once. And I know you will find this odd. Since when did I like boys anyway, right? But I will say it anyway because with you, it feels right. With you, there are no rules, no boundaries, nothing in my life, not a single romantic relationship or friendship with anyone, ever compares to what I have been feeling for you in the short time we have been acquainted. Yes, I may be like a Grinch compared to your joyful and bright self, but you just bring an indescribable light into my life. You are the indescribable light of my life. And if you let me, I know this is a long shot. But if you, by any chance, feel the same way and if you let me, I do want to have a lifetime of burnt apple pies with you. I will watch Dynasty or whatever the hell you are binging at the moment. Hey, I will even crochet with you or do gardening and take care of your plants aka your babies. Because I love you. And I know the other boys you have been out with I blurted so fast that even I could hardly comprehend what I was saying. He put a finger to my lip and shushed me. My heart was pounding so quickly that I thought it could burst at any moment. I was much too afraid of rejection. I do not think I could handle being turned down by the only person I ever felt this strongly towards. But then he smiled. That damn smile. The smile that rivals that of James Dean. The smile that immediately made me forget my worries. And at that moment, I knew everything was going to be alright. I never thought this day would come, he whispered, inching closer to me. I love you, T. That whole outburst, just wow. No one has ever said things like that to me. No one has ever made me feel that way. I let out a sigh of relief and inched closer towards him, grabbing his hand in the process putting it over my heart. You feel that? That is all for you? I confessed. He laughed and there goes the smile that I am crazy for yet again. And you say you're not romantic. I closed my eyes and felt the warmth of his lips enveloping my own. I have never been good with words, but if I were to describe the intensity of that moment, I would use a car crash to paint it. The moments leading up to the accident are crystal clear. I could still smell Louis's minty breath as he approached me. I could still hear the bustling of the other shoppers in the distance. I could feel the cold Ilvermorny chill seeping through my layers of winter wear. But the precise instance when our lips touched seemed hazy, like a particularly incredible dream that you cannot quite recall. But left you feeling so good that you just want to fall back asleep in an attempt to remember it. The moment after was crystal clear too. My hazel eyes met his blue ones. Slowly, the corners of his eyes were lifted and he smiled a genuine smile that made my heart speed up. I saw him and only him, almost as if he was outlined and spotlighted in a room filled with people and Christmas trees. We spent the remainder of the day hand in hand, 
on a hunt for the perfect Christmas tree. Aha, uh -huh. Louis remarked as he let go of my gloved hand when we finally approached a decently sized tree that smelled immaculate. As I paid for the tree and watched as it was being tied, I saw a symbol of our new relationship, an item of hope and a fresh beginning. We had not explicitly talked about our kiss, but the intensity was much too strong to be ignored. Later that night, Louis and I ordered takeout from Lucky One. While waiting, he blasted some Michael bubble while I dusted off boxes in the basement and found his stash of Christmas decors consisting of lights, balls, stars, flowers, and more. We decorated the tree in peace, once in a while stopping when there was a song that Louis felt like dancing to. He would grab my hand, spin himself until I, in all my ungraceful and robotic glory, also grooved with him. I find that when I was with him, I subconsciously let go of all my limitations. The box that I have been caging myself in for my whole life was suddenly non-existent. At that moment, it was only him and me. Later that night, we topped off the Christmas tree decorating session by jointly putting on the star atop the well-styled tree. The motif revolved around white Christmas so the fresh tree was decked out in balls of white and blue. It's beautiful, I complimented, looking at the beauty we have created. It is, replied Louis, so beautiful. I turned to look at him, only to see him staring right through me. He hugged me yet again, a feeling that I have been craving more and more lately. Our connection was simply electrifying. It was the kind of bond so deep that you physically and mentally crave it. It was inescapable. It was undeniable. It was beautiful. And so it was. We spent the remainder of the holiday season in our tiny bubble. The city had restrictions on moving about and going out during the holiday season. But this time around, we had no complaints. We were much too engrossed in each other's company to want to go out anyway. As Christmas was approaching, we were both on leave from work so that meant we had more free time and developed a new routine in unison. We would always start the day with a light but satisfying workout in the mini gym, followed by a hefty breakfast. After showering and doing more household chores, we would settle in the living room and bask in the winter sunlight seeping through the beige curtains. I had been reading a Christmassy novel called Let It Snow recently while Louis was invested in making scarves and beanies for his friends. This would be their Christmas presents, he said. We would do these whilst bundled together in the long white couch. The warmth exuded by each other was beyond comforting. This is what home felt like. At times, we would relish the comfortable silence while other times, Louis would play his Christmas playlist on Spotify. Lunch would roll in and lately, I have been teaching Louis some basic kitchen skills. He was an enthusiastic learner. Although as the recipes got more complex and the mess piled up in the kitchen, he had a tendency to give me those blue puppy eyes and pout that I could not resist. There were days that he just gave up, pulled his let's just make out card, and we would end up on the couch or either of our bedrooms. We would then call takeout shortly after. At night, we would watch Christmas movies or Louis's television obsession at the moment. Bundled up in a large brown blanket that Louis had knitted for us personally, we would watch television or kiss, whichever we felt like at the moment until it was time for bed. This was our new normal. We fell into this routine with ease, as if we had been doing it for our entire life. I suppose, when you find love that is raw and pure, Pieces will fall into place by themselves. Pieces surely fell into place and completed the puzzle that was our blooming relationship on Christmas night. We had just eaten a sumptuous dinner, prepared by the both of us and substantiated by some store-bought dishes. I served a mouth-watering winter spice cauliflower soup that Louis slurped and absolutely adored. If you keep cooking like this, I might just marry you right here, right now, he joked. Doesn't seem like a bad idea. After all, I replied and we both chuckled. I also made roasted turkey with corn and chestnut stuffing for the main dish while Louis whipped out some delectable Brussels sprouts and vegetables. To top off our first Christmas together, he ordered some spice donuts and chestnut ice cream which we ate as we exchanged our Christmas presents. We had agreed to only limit ourselves to one gift for each other because we both knew our tendency to go overboard. Generosity was one of our shared traits. When he handed me a small package wrapped in luxurious gold and white paper and adorned by a ribbon, I never would have expected it to contain a beautiful edition of one of my favorite books. How did you know I wanted this? I inquired after thanking him profusely and giving him a passionate kiss. You mentioned it, I think, maybe a month after we became friends. He replied, I was in awe, disbelieving that he had been that attentive to the things I love. I never pegged him to be much of a book guy so I assumed that whenever I would babble about my interests previously, he did not really care. But I suppose this was tangible evidence that he did care all along and that all this time, he had been listening to me. 
I forced my heart to calm down momentarily so I could muster up the courage to give my present to him. It was a nice ring from Pandora that I intended to double up as his Christmas present and also as a means to ask him to officially be my boyfriend. Despite the routine we have built and the little bubble Louis and I have been in lately, I wanted to give him the courtship he deserved. Knowing that he was a romantic, I surely prayed that this would make him elated. Oh, uh, he squealed, opening up the small paper bag and immediately tearing up at the sight of the ring box. You did not. I smiled, slightly tearing up at the genuinity of his reaction. It isn't much, I started, but I wanted to give you something that symbolized what you are to me. Opening up the ring box, I revealed a heart-shaped sterling silver ring. It was adorned by tiny crown details. And here it is. You are the king of my heart. You have captured my body, my mind, and my soul in all ways imaginable. In the short time we have been together, you made me feel things I never thought I was capable of feeling. Even just being with you in this house, doing random shit we both just feel like doing. You have already taken me to places that no one has ever come close to taking me to. So if you let me, I will love you for a lifetime, Lou. But before that, I hope you will let me officially love you at this very moment. Will you be my boyfriend? A thousand times yes, Mr. Non-Romantic. I'm a 27-year-old guy. Sleep has never been my best friend. For years, I've suffered from multiple sleeping disorders. More than I can count. From night terrors and insomnia to sleepwalking. The list goes on and on. I've tried medication, but it barely works for a few days before I'm plagued by another ailment. The reason for this? Past trauma that I can't even begin to unpack. But sometimes, I get a few days where I sleep normally. No dreams or anything. Just sleep. When I met Jeff, I was having some of those days. I had recently switched my medication, and I felt that this time, it was gonna work. I told him that I had trouble sleeping sometimes, but I didn't go into too much detail because I hated anyone thinking that I was weak. When I moved into my apartment, I found that he was a really cool guy. He instantly told me that he was gay, and I had no problem with that. I identified as straight at the time, but I had a very brief dating history. I just couldn't stay with anyone for long because my depression and sleep problems made me withdraw, so I'd been single for many years. We got along well, but didn't get super close for those weeks because he worked till late. He was a doctor at a nearby hospital. That meant his shifts were irregular, and he sometimes came home while I was sleeping. I worked as a freelancer, choosing to do my work at night because that's when I was trying to keep my thoughts from driving me mad, and sorting through data kept me from losing my mind when thoughts got too much. One night, I couldn't concentrate no matter what. I was eerily aware of the fact that I was alone in my apartment. My mind played tricks on me, making me think of anything that could happen to me while I was alone. Various thoughts ran through my head, along the lines of, an axe murderer could come and end me at any time. Did I lock all the doors? What time was Jeff coming back from the hospital? I couldn't concentrate on my work, and I got more and more frustrated. I went to my bed, and I lay there for a while, but I didn't take my second dose of the pills, because they were starting to give me the side effects. I was scared of falling asleep, because what if someone came in and did something to me? Then somehow, I fell asleep and I found myself in a time from long ago, and I was reliving something I didn't want to. So I ran, and I just remember running. Then a voice broke through to me. It's okay, no one's gonna hurt you. Then I had a dreamless sleep. When I woke up, I felt really strange. Well rested, but as if something was wrong. Everything felt different. From the side that I was sleeping on, to the sheets on the bed that I was sleeping on. I turned to the side, and I noticed that I was sleeping next to someone. I panicked. I couldn't see the person's face, only dark hair. The first thing that I thought of was that I had been kidnapped, so my anxiety went through the roof. I screamed, and the person beside me jumped up. That was when I saw that the person I had been in bed with was Jeff. How'd I end up here? Did I sleepwalk? I asked him. Yes. Last night, you came in here. You were mumbling something about a person hurting you. I thought you were awake, and I tried to talk to you thinking there was an intruder in the house, but then I noticed that you couldn't see me. So, I figured that you were sleepwalking, he said. How'd I end up in your bed? I asked him. You got even more scared, and you were panicking. I tried to hold you and tell you that everything was okay. Then you collapsed in my arms. I let you sleep next to me so I could keep an eye on you if you sleptwalk again, he said. I felt so embarrassed that he had to see me like that. I'm sorry if I made you uncomfortable, I said. It's okay. You told me you had sleeping problems, but I didn't know it was this bad. Have you tried getting help? He asked. Yes. I've been to doctors and have gotten medication, 
But nothing works for long, I said. Maybe it's psychological, he suggested. I don't do therapy, I said. I didn't want to sit while someone unpacked my past trauma. I didn't want to tell anyone. I get it, really. Sorry for intruding, he said. No, I'm sorry for snapping. Is it strange that after I heard your voice, I stopped experiencing the nightmare and I had a dreamless sleep? And I slept peacefully for the first time in ages, I confessed. Really? He asked, eyes wide in wonder. Yes, actually. I didn't have any nightmares last night, I said. He was silent for a while, deep in thought. Then he looked at me as if he had just gotten a brilliant idea. Did you take your pills, he asked. Earlier on, but they didn't work, and they gave me anxiety. I usually have two doses per night, I said. How would you like to share my bed with me? Until you get the pills issue sorted, or for as long as you want, we can even put a pillow between us if that'll make you feel more comfortable, he suggested. He did make a lot of sense. When I had been with him, the sleepwalking had ended, and I had a peaceful night. Okay, I agreed, but only on one condition, he said. Anything, I smiled. You have to consider going to therapy. I don't know what troubles you, but you need professional help, he smiled grimly. I, I understand. I'll consider it. That's all I need to hear, he said, giving me a hug. It took me by surprise, but I liked it. So then, we fell into a routine. Whether he went to work or not, I would go into his room when I wanted to sleep. The only time I didn't sleep in his room was when he had a night shift. Then I would battle with whichever sleeping problem decided to plague me. Sometimes I got lucky, and it was just insomnia. I didn't mind insomnia as much, for the night was when I felt the most alive. Then I would text him as he was working. As I got to know him, I liked him even more. He was very goofy, and very open. He was genuinely nice, and he was always checking up on me to make sure that I was alright. Eventually, I decided that I was going to get a therapist because Jeff had done all he could to help me, and I had promised him that I would try. I found a person who was highly recommended by one of my friends called Sharon. I started to attend weekly sessions, and they helped a bit, but I still couldn't open up as much as I wanted to. When Jeff and I were in bed, we didn't just sleep. I found that I was very affectionate with him. Sometimes I couldn't sleep, so I just cuddled with him until he fell asleep. He looked so peaceful, and I felt safer than I had in years. I think it was safe to say that I was growing attached to him. On his off days, we usually went for walks together in the park. Before I met him, I didn't like anything that had to do with fitness. But he was a doctor, so he was all about fitness and health. So I got into it because I wanted every excuse to hang out with him as much as I could. I couldn't remember the last time that I had met someone who had made me feel so peaceful. Being around him kept me sane. During our walks, we would talk about a lot of things. Soon, he knew me better than most of my friends did, and I was starting to feel a certain way about him. I was always excited to see him. In all of my years, I would never been so caught up in a human before. As the months passed, I started to develop something for him. I would always thought of myself as straight, but the few relationships that I had in the past with girls were loveless. I found it hard to connect with my past girlfriends. I would only get with them because I had been set up, and I had tried to find love, to love someone, but I couldn't. So I had given up and stopped daring, figuring that I just couldn't love, but Jeff made me feel something that I had never felt before. He made me question whether I had been looking for love with the wrong people in the past, but I was scared of opening up about my feelings to him, and with my past looming over me, I didn't feel as if I would be able to truly give myself as I was. One night, he was home early because it had been a slightly slower day at the hospital. Hey you, I thought you'd be home later on, I said. Lucky for you, you have me for the rest of the day, he winked. I chuckled and hugged him. What are your plans? Want to go for a walk? I asked. Nah, it's too cold. Let's watch a movie, he said. Um, okay, I said. We put on a movie and watched it while very close to each other with a blanket. I fell asleep, and I woke up to see him staring at me. Hey, what's wrong? I asked him. You were talking, he said. What was I saying? I asked. You said someone should stop, and that you would tell your parents, he said. I went blank. Everything crashed into me at the same time, and I started crying. It had been eating me up on the inside, and I'd kept it at bay, from my therapist, my family, and from Jeff. Suddenly, I felt like I couldn't hold it in anymore. I needed to tell him. Warning, this may be triggering. When I was 12 years old, my mother had a friend who came to visit us, a rich woman. 
My parents respected her a lot, and she stayed with us for several months. She liked me a lot. I stopped. Hey, I'm here, he reassured me. She gave me gifts, new clothes, toys. I trusted her. And then one night, she came into my room, I continued. What did she do, he asked. I couldn't bring myself to say anything else, because it felt like I was back there, as if I was never going to leave that place. She came into my room every night, and she did things to me. I couldn't tell my parents, because she was their friend. He brought me in for a hug, and he held me close. You don't have to say anything else. I understand. You've held on to so much pain for such a long time, he said, cupping my cheek. I looked down. I didn't want him to see my pain. See? I'm broken, I said. Fuck that. You're not broken. Not in my eyes. You're strong. But you don't have to be strong all the time. Let me be your strength, he said. I was silent. I looked into his eyes, and I knew. I could trust him. I could let go. Then I pulled him closer, and I kissed him. And it felt right. I'd been wanting to kiss him for weeks now, but I never had the courage. He kissed me back tenderly, tracing his fingers on my heart that was beating so fast, a heart that was alive for the first time ever. I kissed him until I couldn't breathe anymore. I needed him, his whole being. When we finally broke apart because of the lack of oxygen, we were silent for a long time. We just looked at each other. I knew as I looked at him that he liked me too. Thank you, I said as I kissed him once more. I'll always be here, he said, and from that day on, he was with me through everything. I eventually opened up to my therapist about what had happened to me. She really helped me come to terms with what had happened, but it wasn't an instant cure. It would take ages for me to heal, but it was a step forward in the right direction. Things with Jeff felt right. We continued sleeping in the same room, and I eventually started having a normal sleeping pattern. Since he worked odd hours most of the time, we took every moment that we could to spend time with each other. But unfortunately, we hadn't had a proper date yet. Then one day, he surprised me by telling me that he had an off day, which was rare during the holidays. I had accepted the fact that I was going to get a full day with him on Christmas and New Year's. Where do you want to go? He asked me. Harris, I grinned. I'm a doctor, not a billionaire, he chuckled. Ah, uh, it's okay. Take me to your favorite restaurant. I acted as if I was disappointed, but I was very excited about our first date. I quickly went to get ready. Knowing him, it was probably going to be somewhere classy, so I had to dress well. So I wore a semi-formal outfit. When he saw me, he beamed and pulled me in for a kiss. Are you trying to make it hard for me to leave the house, Charles? He smirked. Maybe, Jeff. I winked as I pulled away from him and made my way to the door. I knew that he was looking at me as I walked away because he whistled. I couldn't help but laugh. When we got to the restaurant, it was very elegant and classy. His kind of thing. We were seated, and we had some drinks before we ordered. He was staring at me a lot as he drank. Why are you looking at me, I said. I can't get over the fact that you're here. With me, he smiled. Me too. I was so shy to even make a move for weeks, I said. Damn, me too. But yeah, I really like you. You're kind, honest, and wickedly smart. Every part of you is perfect, he said making my heart melt. Don't make me cry. Thank you for pulling me out of that darkness and showing me that I'm not alone. You have no idea what you mean to me. I looked into his eyes. I know exactly what I mean to you, because you mean the same to me. I brought you here to tell you something that I've been holding on to for a while, he said. What is it, babe? I asked him. I thought maybe it was too soon, but I can't wait anymore. I need you to know. I have fallen deeply in love with you, he said. My heart stopped. I hadn't been expecting those beautiful words from him, nor had I expected him to walk into my life. You saw me when I was just a shell of myself, and you rekindled me. I love you. You're my life, I said. And those words were the truth. I had never fallen in love before in my life, nor did I have any idea what it felt like. But I knew that love was wanting to be with someone, to hold them for the whole day, to protect them and make them smile. And I felt all that and more from my Jeff. I hadn't bumped into him. I slept walked into him when my past was haunting me, and he had seen me. I held his hand and I smiled. For the first time in my life, I didn't have second thoughts about someone. I wanted to be in his arms for as long as fate would permit me. The food arrived as we were looking into each other's eyes. It looked appetizing, and I was about to dig in when he held a fork with some food in front of me. And then, I asked? I want to be the first one to feed you my favorite dish, he blushed a little bit. 
I grinned and ate the food. And to be honest, it was mouthwatering. The flavors perfectly mingled with each other. Gosh, I need more, I said as I dug into the rest of the food. He chuckled as I ate the food without stopping. You're so cute. I should take you to this place more often. Finally, I found something that you like to eat, he smirked. He was right. I was a picky eater and was not easily impressed. For our next date night, I took a break to say to him, Yes, my love, he said. Finding him at the lowest point in my life was the best thing that happened to me. I thought that I was destined to be alone, forever, with only my demons to keep me company. But love had other plans. The end.